Uh, it is 7 o'clock, so we are going to get started. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, so the, the first thing uh, is to review and approve the agenda. Um, just a note that the uh, original plan for the tax increment financing application um, vote and resolution, we're, we may talk about that, but it's really going to be a setting a date for a future vote, so the bulk of that conversation will probably be later. Um, and then, uh, did we want to add anything to the executive session? So we, we did have the addendum sent out, just to be clear, we're adding a, a resolution and an exe a possible executive session about real estate. And I would just like to add to that also an update on the MOAT real estate. So another executive session about real estate, two, two different pro topics. Uh, does that sound all right? Um, OK, so without objection, I'll consider that a pro Well, yeah, what's up? <laughs> That's fine, but I wanted to um, pull an item from the consent, consent yeah, agenda. We'll do that okay. in a hot second here. Um, <laughs> so, Deb, too informal. Okay, so <laughs> here, here we go. Okay, so without um, objection, um, uh, we'll consider the uh, uh, agenda approved. Uh, so general business and appearances. So this is a time uh, for people from our, for the, the public to make comments on any item that is not on our agenda. And I, I think, um, did you want to, do you want to introduce, or if there's comments from the public, now's a good time. Try to keep it to two minutes. Uh, or less. And if you'd say your name and what street you are on, or where are you where are you from? Uh, good evening. I'm Sam Borkin. I live in Ward 3 on Cherry Avenue, District 3. It should be called Morris. Uh, I came, and I recognize I was not at the last meeting, but I came because I was um, really upset to learn that the farmer's market would be going back to the lot and not be out. I loved it when it was there during the experiment last time. I thought it was a fantastic thing. And I know that there's a lot of details that I may not have gotten since I was here last week, but I was just really, really disappointed to see that that had failed. And so I don't know if there's any prospect of that changing for this year, but going forward, I would really, really encourage the council to do what they can to make it happen. Because when it was on State Street, I thought it was fantastic. It brought a ton of people to the community. I went. I, wound up buying some sort of kitchen nonsense at the kitchen store because I happened to be there anyway buying bread. And I think it's better for the town, for the city and the community to have it more public and on state. Uh, I guess I'll just uh, comment that I, I think we agree that we would like to find a solution um, for that. And so we're there's still things to be worked out with that, and it's still certainly on the table, um, at least as far as I think we're concerned. Um, so hopefully those details get worked out. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, Stephen Whitaker, I wanted to report on last night's meeting very briefly, uh, but more so speak to some tentative action that was taken in a prior meeting that I was unaware of. Last night was the first meeting of the Central Vermont Communications Union District. They're still wrestling with the name. They formed a couple of subcommittees, uh, of which I'm serving on one. There's a policy committee. It's going to work on bylaws, et cetera. There's a development committee which is going to work on training the members and finding out what infrastructure and opportunities there are. That's There'll be further report forthcoming. I want to more speak to the issue of whether we maintain our membership in EC Fiber. And I have said some of this before, but as a lot of new council members since then, that I've been going to EC Fiber meetings for a, a long time not as a Montpelier delegate, but as a telecommunications and community planner. There's extreme value in Montpelier serving as the nexus between the accomplished, experienced, uh, and successful EC fiber model and the new infant CV fiber model. Uh, we would be forfeiting uh, a significant intellectual and collaborative and resource if we withdraw from there's nothing in statute that prevents us from being in both montpelier being the capital city would be uniquely positioned to leverage that success uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, forward so i would encourage that, that especially to hear from more people who are working on both maybe have this on the agenda at the next cv fiber meeting 
before we take action. I believe uh, there is a t clock ticking by statute of when an appointment needs to be made because John has resigned, I believe. But I would encourage you to appoint someone even provisionally and fully consider whether it's to the city's benefit and both districts' benefit to maintain a position in both. Thank you. Thank you. One possibility is that if uh, any councilor thinks we ought to uh, put that on a, an agenda for an appointment, um, let's, I'm, I'm going to leave that to you all to, to make that suggestion. Um, sound all right? Okay, so sorry. Do, yeah. do we know the deadline by which we would need to make an appointment? I, I'd have to find that out. I think it may have passed, but we could possibly we could talk to them. Uh, if you may recall, the, I think it was the last meeting we raised that issue, and we opted not to appoint anybody. And, and I was going to take steps to withdraw us from the district, and I notified them of that. But we could certainly reconsider that decision, and I could ask if we still could add someone to the district. So we could find that out first. And I, I did get an email from somebody who was interested in applying as well, just, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Hello. Uh, so my name is Laura Gebhardt, and I just came on board as the new executive director for the Montpelier Development Corporation. Uh, so I wanted to come and introduce myself to all of you. Uh, I look forward to meeting all of you individually at some point. Um, and I just want to step out and say that I'll be repopulating the office along State Street. Um, so the doors will be open. Um, and we're looking forward to stepping out and being an active role in the economic development strategies and actions in Montpelier. So thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you. Welcome. <clears throat> OK, so the, on to the consent agenda. Um, is there, yes. So I would like to um, pull item D for further discussion, the down-home kitchen parklet application. I'll second. Uh, I think uh, we need a I motion need to to sure. move to pass it first, without uh, absent that um, item. So I would move to pass the consent agenda less item D. I'll second that. Any other <laughs> things people want to pull? No. Happy. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, I think we should probably just take up D right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll turn it over to you, Rosie. Oh, great. Um, so we have received uh, an application for a parklet um, taking up three spaces at, um, for uh, the purposes of down-home kitchen. Um, my understanding, based on emails today, is that... Um, that the parklet will be reserved for the patrons of Down Home Kitchen during their business hours, but um, as per the parklet ordinance, open to the public for the rest of the time. Um, we have received some comments from uh, business owners and residents on the street um, who are unhappy with the parklet application. Um, we've also received some comments from uh, the owner of Down Home Kitchen, uh, kind of not particularly happy with how the process has played out. So I think there's a couple different things going on here. Um, one is why I think we should probably recognize that um, there's some well-deserved feedback on how that parklet ordinance is working, and maybe we need to do some more fine-tuning there. Um, and the second piece is, um, I think, the way we wrote the ordinance, it was really up to the council to decide when and where these were appropriate. Um, the three spaces here would basically use up the, the last of the spaces that we had allocated. We had said six spaces in total would be allocated to parklets, and they have three already in the city. So this would be the last three. Um, I would <coughs> like to give the, the business owner an opportunity to, to speak and any residents an opportunity to speak on this. Um, and I've got some more comments after that. But, okay. I think I saw Mary Alice here. Would you like to come comment on or Either way, and okay. introduce yourself. And Great. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Thanks for um, letting me be here. I'm Mary Alice Prophet. I'm the owner of Down Home Kitchen. I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to apply. I did hear about this at the um, Montpelier Business Association meeting, which I attend every month and which I believe I'm the only restaurant owner in Montpelier that always attends those. And so in every way possible, I'm trying to show support for not only our restaurant community and our community, but also our retail community. 
And so I did talk to a lot of people, including Carlo and Ben Draper, who have had a parklet um, here in the city, and they've been doing that. So I did discuss it. They're both friends of mine, and I spent some good you know, amount of time talking with them. The point of the parklet is just to provide more outdoor space for the community to be able to be outside. It's a very, very short period of time in terms of a weather window. Living in Vermont, we have major problems with opiates, we have major problems with depression, and having a vibrant, young, smallest capital in America with lots of outdoor spaces where people can sit cafe style and enjoy a beer with their friends and enjoy a glass of wine, and in our case, enjoy a maple creamy because we're going to be putting in a creamy machine, and a lot of the kids in Montpelier have been involved in this process, including my kids, and they love the creamies that are out there, but many of them are on the sidewalks while their parents are working all day, so they can't drive to Morse Farm or Bragg, and some of them don't live in the neighborhood with the current creamy machine, so that's going to be another draw and attraction to the parklet. Um, I am, in terms of design, we try to do something that's very simple, that's not going to detract from the historic nature of that corner and from Langdon Street, because there's beautiful buildings there, and we don't feel like we need to make any statement in terms of architecture. So this structure is just meant to, you know, we're, we're growing some sweet peas, which we feel like will complement the tomatoes that we've been growing in the planters in the past, in which everybody from... Senator Leahy's wife on down to local school kids have come and enjoyed picking the tomatoes, eating the tomatoes, enjoying the tomatoes. So the idea is to do another edible garden. And, you know, we're basically going to provide a space that's, you know, that's open to the community. Right now, we're primarily a breakfast and brunch restaurant. And so, you know, we really enjoy that business. But in order to be able to handle the minimum wage law that's going to be going into effect soon, and a lot of the other high cost of food from doing actual real from scratch food. We're not doing Cisco food out of boxes. We make all of our sausage from scratch. We make all of our biscuits by hand from scratch. We bread everything using organic and Vermont materials. That's a really expensive kind of food to be doing. And not every restaurant at Montpelier currently is working with such high quality ingredients. So it's very important for us that we have to move into more evening hours because we can't afford to do that kind of high quality food and keep the price down so that it's affordable for people in Montpelier, okay? So we're not living in Vail, Colorado or Martha's Vineyard. We're living in a small town with people on a fixed income. So we have to be able to grow and do more business hours. And we think that the seasonal parklet will be both fun for the community and it'll provide just another attraction and a way for people to want to come and sit outside. The idea behind the three spots was around safety, and I went through this with Design Review Committee, and I did pass out. Um, Jamie was nice enough to copy, so that it's a little bit, excuse me, a little bit clearer. But those two river birch trees are intended to go in concrete structures that are planters, and they're going to be outside of the actual parklet, and that's going to provide space. Basically, if there were a car or a delivery truck to turn that corner, just the same way Ben Cheney's trees were right there on the corner. I don't know if you guys remember that. Just to have something visual there that says very clearly to that driver, slow down. Mm -hmm. And I also want to add that there's space between it and the parklet in order to provide just a little bit of a barrier in case something were moving. But it's very heavy concrete, so that's unlikely to move. Um, in terms of other business owners on the street, I have tried time and time again, and I'm going to start crying, to work with the men who own restaurants on the street, consistently inviting them to our functions, consistently reaching out and trying to be neighborly to them, and they have consistently worked against me in every way possible. And I'm honestly sick of it. I'm sick of seeing their faces trying to come up against something when I've invited them in on the process, and I've asked for their input on things like our street party in which it was a neighborhood block activity. And, you know, I'm fine to close down Down Home Kitchen and move on with my life, but what I don't like is to see a perfectly good idea that would be great for our neighborhood kids, old people derailed by people who aren't even willing to step 50 feet over in a parking lot and ever do me the courtesy of speaking to me. And that's been my experience for three years with the people that are in this room right now that have a problem with this parklet. And I just, coming from the South, I'm not used to gentlemen 
behaving in such a way. And I'm going to be very honest with you about that. So that's my take on the feedback that I've gotten from a certain group of people on the block. And I will say we've constantly been vandalized, constantly have people that are overserved been throwing up, vomiting, urinating, and defecating on the side of my building. And do you know who picks that up in the morning at 5 a.m.? Chucho, Mark, Maggie, Jacqueline, and myself. We're the ones cleaning that up every morning. So to come and have a big problem with the parklet after we're having to deal with this is, in my mind, way over the top. Um, I'm going to stop there. I can answer any specific questions because Eleanor Bacon's daughter, Tolia Stoneroff, the architect, took this project pro bono and did all the architectural design, stepped away from Norwich University, where she works, and designed this because she and Otto felt, as parents of Union Elementary School kids, that it would be so beneficial to the kids at Union Elementary School. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Do you want to go ahead? Um, I, I guess my, so for the, the counselors who weren't here for our, our parklet ordinance discussion, um, I voted against the original ordinance, um, not because I'm against parklets, but specifically because I am concerned about the idea of taking this public space and making it private and only um, usable by, um, by patrons of a certain business. So I would be very supportive of this um, if it was just a general public parklet where people could get stuff from your takeout window and go sit, but... Um, folks from other restaurants or people just hanging out downtown could go sit as well. Um, I'm a little bit concerned, especially given the feedback, not from other restaurants, um, but from some other businesses, uh, that they're concerned about parking. And I'm concerned about parking given that, um, specifically with this summer, um, and I am concerned about the, the size, the, the three spaces. Um, so, you know, I may, I was definitely in the minority last time. Uh, I think I was the only one who, who voted against the ordinance to begin with. Um, so I may be completely in the minority here. Well, um, I think it's absolutely worth, you know, considering those things. I moved up here from Asheville, North Carolina. And when I was a little girl growing up, that was a ghost town. And it was the creative entrepreneurs who invested private capital. You'll notice I don't have a loan for this. I'm investing our money in this, okay? I'm not asking anybody to give me money. They were the ones that lifted Asheville from a ghost town to being a vibrant downtown. So sometimes I feel like you have to sacrifice a few parking spots to do something creative and exciting that draws people into your downtown to spend money and not just to go to a chain restaurant in Williston or not just to keep going to Waterbury, drinking at Waterbury, you know what I mean? So I just feel like it's cost benefit analysis and in my mind, I mean, the editor of Yankee Magazine just wrote me a handwritten note and published us as a centerfold in their six-month travel guide and said, your breakfast is my favorite breakfast in New England. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of draw I want to see into Montpelier because I want Montpelier to not just be a place that people want to live. I want it to be a place people want to come and visit and spend their dollars to in order to sustain the lifestyle of the people mm. that want to have shops here because we can't do it with the money from 8,000 people. You know what I mean? It's just mathematically impossible. So you kind of have to sacrifice sometimes, you know? So I, I guess yeah. my only yeah. question is, is, would you be willing to consider um, making it open to the public generally? That's not what the ordinance asked me to do. Carlo and Ben said that's not what they were asked to do. Um, if you guys want to go back to the beginning for this season and rewrite your ordinance and all that, I think that not only Carlo and Ben... I don't know who the third, you know, person is that you referred to, but everyone's going to resend. They're all going to reconsider staffing these parkings. We have to clean them. We have to have people that are making sure no one is not. They're not drinking too much. We have to monitor them. That's labor dollars every hour. Do you see what I mean? Sure. So I think it, the matter is, it's 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 expensive to do that. If the city of Montpelier wants to write us a check we can calculate the labor dollars that would be involved in us, you know, taking care during a busy day of the amount of people coming through, kids spilling things. But you don't want to have a space that no one's monitoring because then it becomes full, full of garbage. I mean, look at this spot over by um, Charlie O's. I mean, so it's often very that's dirty. The third parklet that we have is okay. the one that's right It's after. often very dirty, and it's become a spot for... You know, it, there's nothing wrong with our homeless community using it. They sit at our outdoor tables after we're done over hours. I often give them a free cup of coffee. 
But is that the point of a parklet? I mean, what? that's just my question, basically, from a business perspective. But if that's what the city council decides, you know, that's up to you guys and what your intention is. Any other questions, Rosie? Nope. Any other questions? Go ahead, Donna. Well, I, I have, <coughs> reading this, it says that you can't have it open to the public dealing with alcohol. And so as long as you're serving alcohol in there, your tables, you can serve alcohol there as long as it's private. But as soon as we open during your business hours those tables to be serving alcohol, then there's a, it conflicts with the ordinance and our licensing process. You're so exactly. that's something we have to look at if we were going to yeah. do it. It isn't that we couldn't, Rosie, just that we'd have to right. change that. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that in a tiny town, None of your restaurants here are going to be able to survive without alcohol. I mean, right now, all we sell is Bloody Marys and mimosas, and it's so tiny. But these guys who ha do real nighttime business, like the Langman Street Tavern and Three Penny, I mean, it, and so it's not fair then. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's, so it's very tricky. I, I don't, I wouldn't want to be on city council. I think you have a very hard job. Uh, Rosie. Yeah. So I did, I have a little bit of confusion around that, because when I looked at um, the review by the city departments that i think that the police chief was under the impression that there wouldn't be alcohol served there. We corrected that. He did email us to ask us that. Okay. And we did correct that because we already have an outdoor consumption license for our outdoor seating and a variance that allows us to walk a beer across the sidewalk just the same way Carlo and Ben do at Positive Pie. It's exactly the same. So I didn't see that. So can I just confirm with Bill that, yeah. that the police chief saw that and was still good with the application? Okay. Um. Donna, do you have other questions? Just a, a couple. One, I have a bias. I almost, I like to see Langdon considered as one of the streets that we do a lot of street closures on mm. and give more restaurants a chance to be outside. Um, so in looking at how small Langdon Street, three spots for one, seems like, well, we were only thinking of two or three parklets, and we may definitely we will need to re look at this and revive it. I was a little confused <laughs> of the drawing. If this is your border between the traffic and the tables, and are there just seats on one side? Um, have you been to the Positive Pie Parklet? It's almost yes. exactly the same. Okay. They, have, they have like a... They have like a bench. Yes. Yep. So you can slide in on the street Yeah, because it's so. very narrow. I mean, it's yes. very, very narrow space. Right. Yeah. And in terms of street closures, the more the merrier. I think that this is a wonderful street, and I'm, I support all of our neighbors, and I know that it's important to all of them. So I don't, but I don't think they're mutually exclusive when you're being smart about business, because the more eyes on the street, the more people on the street, the more someone wants to go there. You know what I mean? So it's just, it just draws people in when there's activity right. in terms of business. And my understanding when we approve this, <coughs> what we have now for Park, it's, it's a three-year Minimum of three years, is that correct? We grant we it authorize for three it for three unless is what I read. Unless there's major problems okay. or great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh Connor. Hey, uh, I think first of all, I'm kind of with Donna on the all or nothing approach there. You know, if we're chipping away parking spaces on Langdon Street. Um, I would almost favor like looking at closing the thing down for the summer at least. Uh, but that, that aside, uh, did you look at Main Street as an alternative location? Maybe too much carbon monoxide? I wouldn't want my kids sitting out there. Right. I think it's very unsafe. Mm -hmm. I watch out our windows. I, you have to understand, I punched in all the windows to the side of that building with the help of Design Review Committee. Mm -hmm. And I have a very good visible shot all day long of everything happening in downtown Montpelier in that corner. And the way people speed and they're texting on their cell phones... I don't think it's safe, and I wouldn't want to put money or people that I love jutting out onto Main Street. And it's a very elderly community, honestly, and a lot of people driving shouldn't even be driving. <coughs> so I just think it's dangerous. Yeah. I'm just going to say now, I'm fine to do whatever you guys want. You see what I'm saying? But I just want to express that, like, <laughs> I don't want to be bullied. That's the only thing I'm saying. Okay. Well, and right. I'm, I'm really excited to support this. So um, if there's other uh, folks from the community who would like to comment, please. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of you here. So you would say your name and... Uh, My name is Yvonne Bob. I own Global Gifts on Langdon Street. Um, a number of the merchants on Langdon.
minded to have concerns about there being a park taking up three spaces. Um, and we brought our, our concerns together, which most of you know about. Um, these are things that I specifically want to say to the council. I'm not great at public speaking, so. Um, it's okay. <laughs> so I just want to make um, a few points. One is that I believe previously uh, the parklet proposal required the business to inform neighbors at some point before it was approved. Nobody on Langdon Street knew about this until the Montpelier Business Association meeting on Wednesday when it was announced there's going to be a park. Um, so I really think that is unfair um, that we're not given notice to put in our, you know, to, to have a, a say in how this is going to impact us. Um, I think that should be part of the process. I think it was previously from what I've heard from other people. Um, so um, I, I dislike the idea of a parklet as a commercial endeavor, which I think is what you were saying. Um, I like it as a community space. The other um, parklet that used to be on State Street um, was open to everybody. It felt like a community space. Anybody could use it. I think there was an issue with getting it picked up per periodically. I think that could be dealt with. but. Um, we all as businesses have our rental space in which we make our money. Some of us have some sidewalk space we can use. Um, the idea of increasing a business's, um, basically their business area by taking up public space that is needed, in this case for parking, I, I'm just opposed to. I don't like the positive pie parklet for that very reason. Um, and Mary Alice made it clear that she needs to make more money to serve the kind of food she wants. She wants to be open at dinner time. So I, I think you made it very clear that increasing your revenue is part of your concern. Um, and she can increase her hours to do that at dinner time. I'm not sure she needs to increase her square footage to do that. Um, Langdon Street has 10 businesses, eight on the ground floor, two upstairs. We have 20 parking spaces. And I don't think it's a secret to anybody, or surprise anybody, that we have a f issue with a shortage of parking in town. Um, this winter, there was a lot of construction where the workers um, bagged meters for weeks on end. And people come in saying, oh, I've been wanting to stop here, but there's no, there was nowhere to park. And people, studies have shown people will not, will often will not park unless they can see your business where they're parking from, you know, line of sight. Um, And um, I guess the last point I want to make is um, I'm, I'm very much in favor of the takeout window. I'm sure that will bring more pedestrians down the street. I think that is a great idea. But it's also going to create a parking issue when people want to stop for a minute to pick up their dinner or their meal on the way home. And they're going to want to stop and park somewhere. We already always have people parking um, in unmetered spaces on the street parking in CAX's lot or on Union River Outdoors lot or blocking those folks in. Um, so, it, so to take away three parking spaces right there when you're going to have people who are going to want to stop quickly, pick up their food and go, um, I think makes no sense to give up those parking spaces when they're going to be needed more with the takeout window. But those are my personal issues. Um, I know a number of the businesses feel similarly and have additional concerns. And one resident on the street who just found out about the parklet today is not happy about it. And I think she may have contacted um, somebody else in the council member. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. I, I, I didn't expect I would be speaking. And frankly, my oh, name you, is Susan Banfield Abdo. And um, I don't frequent Mary Alice's restaurant that often. I look around this room, I basically see adults. And I am so in favor as a community member of Mary Alice's proposal because she is a gem in our community. So I have a young, younger son who is 40. He has kids. The kids had a great time walking to Mary Alice's restaurant. I didn't go because I had a slight injury, but 
You know, it was just so wonderful. And we're trying to promote a walking community. And to squelch this is really sad. You know, when my son, who grew up in this community, was able to go and play pool when he was a young kid, be, uh, there was a <coughs> pool um, building behind, near the police station. It was great because the police could monitor the pool, the pool place, and you know, and it was a freedom. And we have a whole group of high school kids that would love to come and get a creamy in this town and be able to sit and be with their friends. We don't, we don't think of our, our kids. So really, I just hope Montpelier doesn't become so stuffy <laughs> that we don't think of our kids, okay? That's all I wanna say. You know, here we're trying to bring young families into our community, but oh, we're not gonna do a parklet. You know, that is ridiculous, you know? So that's all I have. Who else? We've got lots of people. Uh, I'd like to speak on this because Stephen Whitaker again. I have uh, had the opportunity to have to navigate that street when a semi coming around got stuck in that very corner and could not back 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 out into Main Street. In 30, 40 minutes, I had to run to every business and try to find somebody who owned one of the cars to get that car moved, to get that semi, to be able to move forward. Um, I, I like and support kids. I like and support creamies. I think a more appropriate place for expansion of down homes, beautiful food menu, would be in the back lot, similar adjacent to where the Onion River parklet was. The, the, the private side lot at the rear door of down home. But the sidewalk on that side of Langdon is not the same sidewalk. It's half the width of the sidewalk in front of Positive Pi. So there's a very, basically you'd be, you'd be privatizing the sidewalk because nobody's going to want to run the gauntlet between the servers and the tables on that side of Langdon. So you're going to force everybody from the crosswalk side over to the bank side in order to go up Langdon. I am all for supporting more frequent closing on Langdon Street, planned and noticed, and on those occasions, it would be perfectly fine for down home to expand out into the street parking, farmer's market idea, um, but not on a regular basis for the season to close a public sidewalk. Thank you. <clears throat> Seven Morgan and Cherry Avenue. I choose to live in Montpelier because I want to be able to walk and go to things. I went and had appetizers with my great aunt and my parents at Jay Morgan's before coming here. I walked down, I walked back over here, I'll walk home when we're done. And I think there should be sampling more of that. I like the part that we have had, I think there should be sampling more. I may be undercutting my argument on this one, frankly, I think you should close Langdon Street, period. Um, I realize it would cause significant change for some businesses, but I think that the benefit to the city would be huge. Um, so I think there's lots of, for all of those reasons, it's very good to have a parklet. I haven't looked at the architectural studies as to why it's three, not two, or any of that. That's, I trust the DRC or DRB and you folks. But, uh, so I think that for all of those reasons, it would be great to have the parklet. I also am concerned from what I hear from some of the council, it sounds like uh, the potential or the desire to treat this application differently from the existing parklets. And I don't know exactly why, which is why we'll have a stronger comment, but that the feel, that feeling is one that is worrisome to me, that that's the sense I get from the council, that this will be treated at other parklets, and I don't know what that feels. Who else? Go ahead, Peter. <clears throat> and then I'd love to move on. <laughs> uh, Peter Kelman. Um, I just want to make a general comment, not specific to, the, to this particular parklet, because I think other people have pointed out that it should be treated the same way the other parklets were treated. Um, I just came uh, from a five-week trip around the country, and I saw a lot of really vibrant communities. And what made them vibrant was people on the street, not parking on the street. And I think we need more of that. I would love to see restaurants along the river. We, we have parking lots along the river. Crazy. 
the more people, the fewer cars downtown, the better, I think. Thank you. Oh, oh yes, go ahead. Uh, I just want to say, I talked to uh, the Young River guys. They're going to put that parklet back up this year, too, so it'll be 20 feet away from Would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, Brad from uh, Lang Street Tower. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but Onion River is going to be putting that parklet up. They already have for free for every individual to use already. They're going to be doing it really soon, so I don't see the purpose of having two parklets right next to each other and taking up three spaces on that small street is uh, not good for all the other businesses. Thank you. All right. Hello, my name is Scott, and I also work at Lancaster Street Tavern. Um, I have a unique perspective on the streets. I've worked on that same street for 19 years, and I've seen the way the street has been treated with street parties, closures, etc. And I worry actually about the future of street closures with a parklet not only closing off one entire side of the sidewalk for foot traffic, but also being immediately before any event and with any event happening, how that interaction might occur. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that would be an immediate like no for the parklet, but it seems to be the kind of thought that it might need to be put into this without a simple yes, let's clear it, no, let's not, maybe we floor this for a little bit, think about all that's been said here today, and come back, and maybe at a further point in the future when we've all looked at every issue, not just theirs, ours, and everyone in between, but just the idea that there are a lot of nuances to this, and when all is considered, maybe a lot more thought needs to be put into it before votes actually cast. All right, thank you. All right, what's your desire, team? Uh, Jack. I'm just or actually, I'm unclear of what you're asking. Well, uh, would you like to make a motion? Would anybody like to make a I motion? I would move that we adopt uh, Down Home Kitchen's parklet uh, application as drafted. There's a second. Yeah, I'll second it so we can have some discussion. Okay, further discussion. Who's, I, I'm concerned about okay. this. I... Uh, I've been reviewing the uh, ordinance, and uh, it's hard for, hard for me to understand, w based on what the ordinance says, how we're supposed to make a decision. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to me to give any standard for saying yes or saying no, and uh, and that real that's that's kind of troubling to me. And I, I wasn't here when the ordinance was passed. I wonder if there's anyone who might have some thoughts about that. So I, I, I think I can say, I mean, when we uh, create, when we allowed this to happen, I mean, one of the, the thoughts for um, keeping it with the council was that I mean, this was experimental. We wanted to see if it worked. And I think the uh, feedback from our pilot time with this was that it, it was very successful. Most people really did like the parklets. Um, I mean, I think it's conceivable that we could rewrite the ordinance so that the power for approving or not approving them um, stays with uh, the, the DRC or the DRP. Um, but for now, that's, that's with us. So, I mean, we need to look at does it meet the requirements to have all of the, the staff reviewed it and uh, approved it? Uh, you know, does it, is it safe? Uh, is it going to work with... Uh, other events, etc. That that's uh, so. If they if they approve it, then beyond that, it's our discretion. Um, you know, do we think this is a good thing for the city? And there, you know, there is a provision for um, strictly public parklets uh, that are non-commercial, but there is also a provision for commercial parklets. Yes, Rosie. And when we had that discussion, I think that we did also discuss whether or not to limit it to, you know, two in a row as the, the positive pie one is. And the discussion was sort of that um, we wanted to leave it up to the council to decide if that was, you know, if more in a row was appropriate in that particular spot or not. Um, so I think we specifically didn't limit it to two or one or whatever in order to give ourselves the opportunity to yeah. evaluate and make a decision. Um, not out of a sense of we were going to approve, you know, anything um, if somebody met these requirements. But 
Um, I don't, I agree with Jack. I don't think that we've made it particularly apparent to businesses what our standards are, and I don't think that's fair. Um, so I think that this ordinance definitely, as we've been presented with a real scenario, um, could use some work. Well, and I think we're learning through it, too. I mean, in the meanwhile, um, I'm, I think this is going to be a great thing for downtown. I'm excited to um, sit there myself. Um, so, I, I mean, I hope that we wouldn't change the rules on the fly. But, it, I mean, if in the future we decide, you know, we don't want three in a row, then, you know, we can change it for next time. Um, I, I guess that's what I would hope. Yes, Donna. No, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just no, wanted to be next. You're great. No worries. Uh, I wasn't trying to apply the ordinance difference, but I was trying to really be cautious because it is as a, bit, a bad corner. But then as I'm sitting here, cars are there. And if a truck can't get by the car, then it would be in the same spot. And in that particular location, it makes more sense to use all three than to have a car parked beside of it right there. So I, I feel we, we have in the past said we would leave it up to design review to look at it and make the standards versus trying to dictate from our perspective, use the expertise we have for looking at the design. The fire department looked at the police for safety. So as it's presented, I feel, yes, we need to do more work, but I feel this merits being accepted and giving them a three-year trial and, and see what happens. And if we, meanwhile, we should be working on the policy before we take any more applications in. But this was submitted with what sits there today. So I feel we should support it on what sits there today. So I would second your motion. Or you sorry, I had second. I support your motion. There you go. Uh, Glenn. Um, just to clarify, was there a period when uh, part of the application was uh, review or consent by neighboring businesses or other people on the street? This is the first application since we've had an ordinance. Um, the others were done as trial periods, okay. uh, and there was the, the public in, one in the street, uh, and we got some feedback about that, and that was moved, and then Positive Pi did theirs, and there was, um, I don't know exactly about the reach out, there was definitely a, a trial period that came into the council and discussed it. I'm not sure about notice. We actually were talking in staff today that we noticed that the ordinance doesn't have a notice provision, and I think for future, for the it certainly should. Uh, but I, I don't know if there was a requirement or it was just an urging. But there was no regulation before it was a trial period. This is this is application one under. So we have our first edit for the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and have there been applications for parklets that the city has turned down so far, or ideas for them? No, this is this is the first the first, the first one under the order, first application or consideration. Um, as a, no, the only other two were the, the two that with the public one, the positive five. There was the one that became the pocket park. Correct, and, and but that was not state. necessarily at the city's direction. Oh, okay. okay. Right, that was a student project. <clears throat> okay, uh, Connor. Uh, if this were approved, would anything? preclude Langdon Street Tavern or Sweet Melissa's from opening up parklets as well if they apply? Well, as far as the proximity? Well, the, number, or? The, the number. The, the, yeah. the, the current ordinance uh, limits six total parking spaces in downtown. So currently positive pi would take two. This would be three and right now there's one with the bike parking parklet. So that's the six. So unless the council changed the number unless the ordinance changed the total number of parking spaces. But absent that requirement there would be I guess I'm, ha I'm a little confused and it could just be my own general malaise um, but if what I heard was Mary Alice's application was the only one we received so does Positive Pine not have to do an application this year? Oh, that was okay. part of their pilot and um, they did still have to get their flood permit mm -hmm. and, but they had already been reviewed for all of the other Okay. and so can Conceivably, then, though, so next year, so so if this is granted tonight, this would be for three years. And then, so next year, there would be an additional three spots that would open up? Conceivably. Or? I'm trying to think if theirs would be two or three years. Okay. Have to see. Okay. Depending on what year. Or we could decide to increase two. it. Right. Okay. Are we, are we set, team? 
<laughs> all right. No more discussion. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is that four? I think there's four. Opposed? No. No. Okay. I think that's four to two. So carries. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you all for your thoughts on this. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it. Great. Uh, all right. So moving on. Tax stabilization. Uh, I uh, Fred, do you wanna do you wanna come up? Good evening. As Fred's sitting, this is the second required hearing on the same application that you heard last time. If there's any substance change, I would report that uh, Fred and I met on Monday with a prospective tenant, so I can I can tell you that he is actively seeking and has uh, Good prospects, but there is not a commitment yet. It's the type of tenant that would certainly be uh, no promises of them. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yes, go ahead, Brett. I'd just like to make a, uh, c uh, one clarification from uh, the Times Argus article um, that was in, uh, which is that it was suggesting that we're asking for half of the taxes and it's half of the municipal portion of the taxes. Uh, and also the address is one home farm way. I think our office address was, was used. Um, and I just wanted to make a general comment, uh, having had a chance to reflect on the last meeting, uh, which is that uh, we've been in the redevelop redevelopment business in Montpelier for 20 years. Uh, this is our fifth, fifth project. Uh, three of those have benefited from uh, your tax stabilization uh, program. Um, the folks that we deal with uh, are varied. Uh, we serve uh, to create space for nonprofit healthcare professionals, uh, education administrators, um, land conservation professionals on the nonprofit end, and also, and this is just limited to Montpelier, also uh, uh, dairy farm co op managers. Um, environmental consultants and aerospace uh, firms and we take notice when the city has these incentives and and when we choose to uh, make investments either on speculation or in hopes of securing a, a tenant soon thereafter uh, we're pleased to hear that, that the uh, personal property uh, has also been added to that um, to the tax stabilization incentives um, we follow I, I being a project junkie, I follow some of your uh, work, and uh, certainly nice to see that, that an economic development strategic plan was done. Uh, glad to see that you've set, uh, worked to set up the Montpelier Development Corporation, uh, and just wanted to say we uh, we have a passion for this work, and we, we consider uh, when the when the council grants approval of these types of incentives that uh, you're basically declaring the city open for business, and and I think. Uh, with all the projects in the pipeline, it, it, uh, the next day, few years looks very promising to me. So, thank you. So really, we um, need to have a public hearing on this, so I'm going to um, open the public hearing. If anyone from the public has comments on this tax stabilization possibility. If no one does, I'm going to, well, I guess we could close it. <laughs> um, and so it doesn't say anything in here about um, voting to approve it, but I assume that we Yes, you do. Um, okay. I believe under the recommendation at the end it was to, uh, or maybe under the cover sheet, it says uh, the recommendation is to approve it with the conditions as per the memo, which would be at this point it would be the level three the approval and uh, with the deferral to provide them the option to come back if they meet the job, to demonstrate that they meet the job criteria and the option to apply for, which is we've done with at least one other project in years. So I'm going to close the public hearing if no one has anything they want to say. Um, comes from council. Uh, so Donna first and Ashley. Uh, I was just going to make the motion okay. and then we can discuss it. Yep. But to approve uh, the Montpelier, it's called Auditorium LLC Tax Stabilization Application with Conditions as per the City Manager's memo would be a level three. With an option. With an option. One year option to come. With a one year and option. For a second. 
Jeff said. It. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Uh, Ashley and Rosa. So one of the things that I have struggled with consistently with, with the request for tax stabilization uh, is that we ask our residents to pay their fair share. And I appreciate your, your comments about the kinds of businesses that you do this work for. Um, because I think those are the kind of businesses that we here in Montpelier want to attract. What I struggle with, though, is that Montpelier is not an affordable place for us to live. Uh, it, is, it is incredibly expensive. Rents are high here. It is a beautiful place to live. It's the best place I've lived, you know, and I love it here. Um, and, and I struggle with knowing that the money that I'm paying in rent, which translates into taxes paid to our city, um, subsidizes you know, private ventures, which do add to our local economy, and I, I love that. It just, to me, there are other ways that the city can encourage these, and um, I, I intend to, to vote against this, but I want you to know that I do support you in other ways, and I think that there are other ways as a city that we can support these partnerships. To me, um, tax stabilization and, and, um, and tax benefits like that are, are not the smartest, best way to encourage that kind of development, but I appreciate all of the work that you have done on behalf of the city over the years, and I realize that probably sounds a little hollow knowing that I, I don't support this, but um, you know, I, I, I understand how much work goes into these projects and how much it takes out of you and your family's business to do this, but I want to be cognizant of the fact that we are, in essence, um, having taxpayers sort of um, cover cover that in a way, or or at least we have to continue paying our share, and and some businesses don't. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm I'm not persuaded um, by any of these, and I did vote against the last one as well, uh, which was I believe Caledonia Spirits' request. Um, but I do I do think that there are other ways that I would be more than willing as a city to support your development ventures because I think they're important. Um, but this is not the way for me. If I could just respond, um, we uh, what we find is that. Uh, while the capital city is, is attractive on many fronts, uh, utilities, schools, et cetera, um, restaurants, uh, that for the businesses that we serve, uh, that they're operating in a county, kind of a county setting. And uh, I read your TIF report, and, and uh, Waterbury and Barry score higher. Um, and I think uh, as, a city, as a city resident for 20 years, we're, we're playing a little bit of a uh, catch up on both growing the grand list and growing jobs. And this is really one of uh, one of the only only incentives that, that are available, and and the businesses do do take notice um, of, of that incentive. Uh, payroll dwarfs lease payments, um, and which by, by bringing in jobs, uh, it's, it's probably not going to uh, necessarily solve housing because uh, it's creating additional housing demand. But you, you I don't know what, whether it's the chicken or the egg, but you sure. you have some people who relocate, <laughs> relocate here and then look for work, and then you have other people that come to a certain uh, business that's that's just located here and then find uh, housing but uh, it's all it's all interrelated and uh, I won't pretend to tell you which comes first but uh, commercial housing projects are always yes and, right <laughs> <laughs> nope I know um, and and I do appreciate that and I do I think that these are the, these are the kinds of complex questions about how we move forward as a city that I am most interested in um, and and for me you know there are there are other incentives that the city could create. I just and and I I appreciate that it is. I work in Barry myself, so I, I understand you know sort of what the Barry market looks like versus what it looks like here, and it is a challenge, and it's hard to to sort of bridge the two very different communities who are quite the same, in fact. Yeah. Um, but I I do, and I appreciate your comments, and it's certainly something that I think as a, as a council and as a city we need to start addressing more proactively. If I can add, I've spoken to other business owners and downtown merchants, and they certainly, as much as they l like to see uh, more people downtown, living downtown, they also like to see purchasing power. So if you're bringing in on an annual basis another couple of hundred, you know, 25, 50, a couple of hundred jobs, that, that has an impact on the, on the downtown, and, and, and it's a very positive one. Um, so I am going to support this, um, and a really important key for me in supporting this is your commitment that you would not be poaching jobs from downtown Montpelier, that you would be bringing, it, you would be looking to bring in a business from uh, outside of Montpelier, um, and so you gave that commitment at the last Good. meeting, yeah. um, and so I'm therefore willing to, to support this with Thank our conditions. You. Other comments? Uh, all right, so we have uh, 
motion, I think, right? And it's been seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. So, motion carries. Um, and, uh, great. Thank you. Um, did, did the motion carry? The mo yes. uh, motion did carry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, motion did carry. <laughs> I had to stick around for that. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. A couple close ones. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, the tax increment financing application was what we would be you know, going into more now, but uh, that particular uh, vote needs to be warned in an especially long time, and so we just need to pick uh, the or set the dates. You want to explain that? So we are right. We had to, in doing the due diligence on this, we required the, the final hearing and vote needed a 15 day properly warned period. So we actually did warn it on Monday. So it will be warned in time for the 23rd, our next meeting. And we'll have to require a second informational hearing. But we're, the first one counts, it just doesn't, we have to have the second one with the proper notice. The warning has included the link to the video from the last meeting, and we'll be taking public comment during the whole 30-day period in between the last meeting and this meeting. So this, it won't be as long. <laughs> the <laughs> presentation won't be as long, but there'll be a brief public informational meeting at the next meeting, and then we'll conduct the vote on whether to go ahead with the TIF application. And so we don't even need to vote on this. It's already been it's warned. It's already been warned. For that. So, okay. I guess it's just so a footnote doesn't then. want to do it. <laughs> Uh, Rosie. Can I just ask, um, I've seen the, a couple letters from the business organization supporting it, but we haven't received any other public comment other than that, or you're collating all that comment? I don't think we've received anything other than those from okay. the business. Okay. So I guess we're going to move on then. Um, all right. So the water resource recovery facility presentation um, is where we are at now. And this is, this is the meatiest part. Okay. of our evening. <laughs> oh, you're meaty, too. You're meaty, too. Super. <laughs> meaty, meaty, meaty. <laughs> um, are you... you uh, do yeah, we do have a PowerPoint. Okay, I'm going to yeah. move in. Um, I'll start with the introductions before we get to the PowerPoint. I'm Kurt Modica, city engineer. Um, we've been working on an upgrade at the plant for some time now. Um, Could you move the speaker yeah, over? Sure. I'm really going to nag you when I can't hear yeah, you. That's okay. It's important that that's what you're saying. <laughs> um, to my right is Chris Cox. He's our chief operator. He's um, been with the city for about six years. He's been our chief operator for the last two. He's done a lot of great things at the plant, a lot of energy improvement projects. Um, we'll talk a little bit about tonight. And this is Wayne Elliott. Um, he's the city's uh, consultant engineer. Um, when we started looking at the upgrade um, the summer of 2016, well, we went through a process, um, a funding, um, state funding process, and uh, it's called the State Revolving Loan Fund, and went through a consultant selection process. Aldrin Elliott was our selected consultant. Um, about uh, halfway through um, preliminary engineering of that um, upgrade, um, we were presented with an organics energy project with uh, ESG, who is, uh, they've got some members here in the back if we end up having some um, questions at the end of the presentation. So um, we sort of put the preliminary engineering report on hold, and but we thought we'd, um, it was important to retain a, a consultant engineer for the city as we move through the organics energy project. So. Um, we've been bouncing off ideas off Wayne, having um, him review things for us as we work through this process, and um, it's been a really, uh, really great asset for us. So, uh, with that, we'll just um, jump into the presentation here. This thing going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sleep down here. Mm-hmm. Now. <laughs> the old guard is the heads up there. Uh, I've got mine on my iPad. <laughs> So uh, this presentation is really just a status update. We've got some new council members that are not familiar with the project. Um, we did have a tour uh, with the three new members, and I think it was, um, it was really good. You guys asked some great questions. And um, so we're not asking for any decisions or any votes tonight. It's just, uh, just sort of get everybody up to speed on what we've been working on and um, you know where, where we're going to go from here, what our next steps are, um, and then to answer any questions you might have. So um, just to give a little background on where we started, uh, our steady state uh, master plan um, had a $3.5 million project slated for the plant. Um, that was basically for to get us by the, the next 10 years. But um, you know, as we got into the preliminary engineering with Aldridge and Elliott, we started to see that there was a greater need at the plant. Um, there was some additional equipment that needed to be replaced that uh, that would not be covered by that three and a half million dollar um, budgeted amount. So after doing uh, some initial analysis, um, we came up that we need at least 7.1 million, and this is a little more than maybe the than I think we presented to the council of about eight, you know, eight months ago because we did escalate construction costs. Um, Every you know. time you come, it goes up. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> we longer you wait, the more now. things cost. <laughs> So right now it's uh, it's looking at 7.1 million uh, and then another 4.9 million uh, somewhere around year 10 or 11. Um, so that's just sort of uh, keeping what we have going. That's our our baseline project. Um, our staff has done a lot of in-house projects. We've done um, a lot of uh, a lot of work with Efficiency Vermont, um, improving fi efficiencies, reducing operating costs at the plant, and. Uh, even even as much as some you know fairly large pump replacements which uh, we saw during the tour um, so we have a lot of capabilities in-house uh, but the need right now is just it's more than uh, we can accomplish um, without some outside contracting so just to sort of further compliment uh, Chris and his, and his team at the plant um, there's been some awards given um, there's been um, the award from Efficiency Vermont um, for energy management and um, the governor's award for um, environmental excellence. So just a um, couple of things that, the, that our plant has been recognized for. Um, and from that, uh, from that recognition, a, uh, an article was written about um, the work that they've done at the plant in a trade magazine called Treatment Plan Operator, TPO. Uh, ESG, who is um, Energy Systems Group, who is our um, design build consultant right now, they saw that, uh, reached out um, to the city through MEAC, 
uh, and MIAC facilitated the meeting with um, DPW, and that's sort of how the whole organics to energy concept um, started out. So uh, just a, a brief explanation on energy performance contracts. It's, it's a way to set up a, a fixed price with financial guarantees um, rather than the route that we traditionally go at as uh, an engineer doing the design work, bidding that work out for a contractor. Um, there is some risk in change orders um, or change in scope of that. So it's just a, a different way to go about it, and um, that's what we're uh, working on now with ESG. So uh, through the opportunity of an organics energy, energy contract, um, there's a potential for an additional 22,000 gallons of liquid organic waste and the associated revenue that you can receive from that waste. Um, there are uh, receiving station improvements. If people have been down to the plant uh, during the day. Uh, there's quite a, a backup of trucks. There's um, a lot of demand for a facility to treat septage and leachate. And by having two receiving stations, we'll be able to you know, to double our capacity for getting those trucks out of there. And then the other opportunity is the guarantees. So um, by working with a design build uh, energy services contract, you have some financial guarantees uh, built into the contract so that uh, the city doesn't absorb all the risk associated with uh, the improvements and the associated revenue. So just to summarize the options we're looking at here, the base case is that 7.1 million with another 4.9 at year 10 or 11. Um, there's a, a sort of a middle option, which is uh, we're calling it AIOE. So it's uh, aging infrastructure and organics to energy mix. So that does have the receiving station improvements and it has uh, some digester improvements, just not the optimal mixing and heating. Um, as opposed to the full energy neutral project, which is really setting the facility up um, to use the methane, the excess methane, really for, for power or some other identified beneficial use. Um, there, is, uh, there is use of the methane under both of those um, AIOE projects, um, primarily for heating the buildings in the wintertime, but um, you're really maximizing gas production under the under the energy neutral pr project. So this is just a, a picture of what areas would be worked on under the different scenarios. Uh, yellow is the AI work. That's really what we're looking at initially. And the blue um, is what would be incorporated into improvements under the uh, organics energy project. So, and then the... Um, Back here is where the uh, CHP would go if that's selected, uh, which we're, we're calling a, um, a phase two project right now. We can talk about it a little bit more at the end. <clears throat> so I'll just look at some of the financials. Uh, this is really high level financial um, outlooks. We've, uh, we're still fine tuning this a little bit, um, but in general, you can see the difference of the of the impact of the different projects, of the scale of the impacts. the The base case, um, so you know, roughly a three hundred thousand dollar budget impact uh, annually on debt service, um, and then about ninety or ninety two thousand for the uh, the two uh, organic to energy projects, which we're calling you know a phase one. And then if you go to, we're looking at two different potential rates if the city were to go to P. Um, a uh, CHP project, there's two potential rates that we could get for selling that power to the utility, to the grid. Um, on average, the last couple uh, applications have been around 9.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, we did have some discussions um, with VEPI, which is the organization that, that manages um, these power, uh, per, uh, power sale agreements for the Public Utility Commission. And if the city were to lobby um, to have a set aside for biomass, um, which is what we're proposing under this project, then it is a, there's a likely a, or a strong possibility that we could get a 12 and a half cent per kilowatt hour rate. So those are just the two different financial, um, the budget impacts for those two different rates on a, on a phase two project. 
And then under, underneath that, you can see um, the impacts to um, carbon dioxide production. So every project will reduce, uh, reduce our uh, emissions. Some of that has to do with trucking the solids because we're going to be reducing the amount of solids with these upgrades. Uh, some of it has to do with heating the plant and reducing oil use. But in, in all cases, we will be um, reducing our footprint, carbon footprint. Before you yep. move on, okay. just, can, can you separate for me columns two and three? I'm not sure I understand. Sure. So um, we're calling, they're both an organics to energy project. They're, uh, the difference is really uh, what we would do for digester improvements. So that's the, um, the breaking down of the solids and the associated methane production from that. So the 16.1 million has a, a much more robust mixing system for the digesters. Storage. And, also, yeah, and it also does include um, storage for the gas. So there's a, a different type of cover that's sort of like a balloon that would go on the biggest digester. Yes, we talked about that. Yep. So, um, yeah. One such a larger amount of reduction of CO2. I mean, that's huge compared to. From 37 to 115 yeah. is what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of that's the, the solids breakdown. By, so, by having the improved mixing mm -hmm. and heating, um, you really break down that solids and you have a lot less trucking. Well, this is a, a graphical of, um, of the budget impacts for the different scenarios. Same sort of thing, just put it in a graph form. And just to give an update of what we've been working on, so it's been a few months since we've come to council and talked about this project. Um, I already sort of went through those discussions we've had with EPI about the, the potential set aside to get the, uh, the higher power rate or um, the higher rate for selling power. Uh, another big piece that we got from ESG was uh, their basis of design document that really went into the technical details of uh, what they would do for chemical addition, um, you know, what the impacts, which are really zero, to what our effluent limits would be. So what would we be discharging for phosphorus by taking in all these additional uh, organic loadings. Um, they ran it through a, a model that um, that showed that there will be no negative impact on the quality of the of the effluent leaving the plant. Uh, so we did have um, Wayne look really carefully at that and did a full review and provided comments to ESG. They they came back and answered all of our concerns. So we have a, a much better comfort level now um, with you know how the plant will operate following this project. Uh, and then also we've done some updates to the cash flows. Uh, some of that in that basis of design document did have some changes to the, the way the plant would be operated um, as far as where chemicals would be injected. Um, and so we incorporated that information. There's cost implications associated with, uh, with the chemical use. And so we did then update the cash flow models, which were shown in those previous slides. Uh, so I'll just touch on some of the concerns we raised. Um, you know, with ESG about uh, the changes at the plant. One is the effluent limits, and um, they've shown that there will not be an impact on that. Um, um, when yep, you're talking uh, about limits, you're talking about quality, or are you talking about volume as well? Um, it's Yeah, it's annual pounds of, of phosphorus. So okay. it's state it's, permitted it's, limits. So okay. That's so sort of both. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was a question that I had that I think was hanging out there before was, does this impact our permits? Right. You know, and you're saying it doesn't. Right. Um, the other thing is the, the capacity of the, of the plant to take on um, really additional uh, users. So, you know, we have the city's talked a lot about uh, wanting to promote housing, economic development. We want to make sure we have capacity at the plant to treat additional users that are coming on. So, um, hydraulically, the plant is only uh, about 2 million out of potentially 50%. Right out of about 4 million, so we're roughly 50% on hydraulic capacity, but what we're really concerned about is the organic capacity, which is breaking down um, the, the bacteria. Or the we're breaking down the organics using bacteria, so it's really aeration ca capacity, biomass uh, reactors. Right. 
So right now we're at 51% on that. Um, this project would bring us up to 82%. But um, that still allows us, if you're looking at residential units, um, you know, we could have, the, we'd have the capacity for an initial 1,000 homes. So there's still plenty of capacity. We're using a, a big chunk of it for this project, but uh, there is still plenty of room for growth for the city. Um, and then just to touch, uh, touch base on what we're thinking for a two-phase approach, um, there's a couple of things we want to do before we move into, this is public works, um, and the Energy Committee may want to speak to this. There's a few members here. They've been really involved with this project, really helpful, um, a great asset for us. Um, but right now, public works is, we're sort of thinking that we should split this into two projects if, if the council uh, wants to pursue an organics energy project and a, and a CHP project that we should do it under um, two separate contracts, really. Well, the reasons for that is, one is um, we really want to have an opportunity to monitor how much methane we produce after we do an organics energy project. So we have a good feel on sizing the generator um, and just ensuring that we can get uh, the right sort of waste stream to create the methane that we'd need to run a generator. Um, there's a couple different types of waste. There's dairy, there's um, septage, which does not produce a lot of methane dairy would produce a lot so um, we'd like to have some some time to explore sort of what the market is um, and and really the other thing is to uh, just make sure there's not uh, an option that might be better than CHP we did a high level look at some different options uh, early on in this project we looked at um, connecting to district heat we looked at um, you know developing a uh, methane fueled fleet for the city. Uh, none of those options were really you know, economically viable, but they also didn't incorporate any potential grant opportunities. So we'd like to explore that a little bit more um, before we move into a CHP. And just one other sort of concern that we have is that, is that our, our permit, our discharge permit from the state is under appeal by CLF. Um, it's going to take some time uh, to work through that. Those things usually could go on a couple of years before they're resolved. But um, we need a, we need an upgrade, so we don't want to wait and not do anything. Uh, we're just it's it's time. Um, but it's just a concern we want to make council aware of that our permit is under appeal, and um, it's something that we're keeping an eye on. These kind of improvements have any impact on that appeal? Um, it, our, our discharge limits won't change from what we have now. So as far as what our quality of our water leaving, which is really what the appeal is about, um, that won't change. Um, so the next steps. So we've decided that, um, well, Let's go step back for a second. The a lot of the capacity that uh, we're going to get at the plant is by taking the septage out of the digesters where they go now, and moving them through the uh, the liquid stream process at the plant. Um, so there's a relatively low organic load in um, in septage as opposed to like dairy waste or other high strength waste. So. In order to, uh, but it is going to change sort of how the plant's running. So what we wanted to do is take some time and try it. Um, so we've actually uh, purchased the equipment, Chris has purchased the equipment to, to send the septage directly into, this is the picture of the primary tank at the plant. Uh, that's where all the liquid from the pipes uh, enters the plant. And when you see the trucks um, backing down to the, to the discharge point, that goes straight to the digesters now. So we're, we want to take, a, I think, about two months, eight, eight, weeks. eight weeks time to really see what happens when we do this. Uh, the, the modeling from ESG indicates um, there won't be any problems, but we want to we want to see it in, in real time. So we're going to need a little bit more time before we're ready to do a, to make any sort of recommendation, but um, that's one of our next steps. And then from that, we're going to look at uh, what do we need to do? Do we have to up our chemical use? Do we have to... Um, add a discharge point or injection point for the chemicals. Uh, and there are some recommendations in ESG's basis of design 
for that. So we're going to be um, essentially follow their recommendations and um, ensure that everything operates the way the model shows it will. Uh, we also need to make sure the project can get permitted. So we need to take a we need to have a meeting with the uh, Vermont DEC, uh, go over the go over the project and make sure there's not going to be any permitting issues. We don't expect there will be, um, but we want to make sure it's not a problem before we make any recommendations. And then we we need to start um, talking to some of the haulers about what sort of rates we would be charging. Uh, there's really a, an anchor uh, hauler. It's called Hardigan now. Um, they were recently purchased by Wind River. So uh, we're not, <clears throat> we're probably going to, you know, wait maybe a, a month or so before we start having those talks, but it's something we just want to explore a little bit um, before we move forward. And this is sort of along the same lines. Um, we also want to want to work out the contract with the SG if, if the council chooses to move forward with an organics energy project, work out the guarantee structure. Um, there's what's called the measurement and verification protocol. So we have to verify that the savings um, they're showing in, in their cash flow models um, are actually achieved once the project's complete. And we, need to, we need to develop a method to measure that. Um, we have a little bit more work to do on those cash flow uh, models with, um, with the finance department and ESG. But uh, for timing, we're the, sort of the real, the latest we could have a, a council approval of the alternative is September 26. We'd like to have it before then, but that's really the um, the end date to make um, a November bond vote, and then that would lead into an October uh, October 24th public hearing. So it's just sort of the timeline, the sort of latest timeline we could fit within um, to have a bond vote in November, and then we'd be ready to go in the spring. We'd, we'd time that bond vote with the general election. So that's the overview, and I welcome any questions from folks. <laughs> which is that I'm really impressed with how much you guys have really dug into all these questions. And I, I had a lot of concerns. I'm sure you remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, That's good. And, you know, as we're going through, you've answered a lot of those questions, and it's clear that you're really um, doing a lot of that legwork and backup work, and I, I just really appreciate I know that's got to have been very time-consuming, and I appreciate that you've done that. Thank you. Uh, so in the material that you gave us before, um, uh, tonight uh, that's available online. Uh, it's sort of coming back to Glenn's question about, okay, what's the difference between column two and column three? Uh, so as I understand it, the, there's the aging infrastructure and organic energy, that's column two, and then what we should, it's called phase one is column three. Um, so, and I, I also appreciated in the, um, in that document, I think it's 4.0, has a side-by-side -side comparison of what um, that all entails, and so I just wanted to make a comment uh, about this. So it's it just really getting into the, the specifics of what the, the difference is. I mean, it looks to me like I'm, maybe I'm just bringing my own, like, what I understand to this, so please, you know, help me if I'm wrong here, but um, I, it seems to me that you would probably need digester covers so that you could collect the gas and flare it properly. Is that, are those two things linked? Uh, we have digester covers currently. It, it, it'd be a different just, style of cover. Okay, that's what I had yep. thought you were digester covers. So, okay, yep. great. So, yeah, um, and then, I mean, as I was reading a little later, it um, says, you know, the, the, um, digest, the, the gas collection flares are old, and so they need to be upgraded they need to be more reliable. Um, I just, I mean, on the, on the face of it, uh, uh, the gas collection and flare seems like a priority to me. Um, I would like that. I would want that to be up to code, reliable. Um, but I'm curious for your thoughts on that, though. I'd have to look at the exact section. Um, it's all up to code. Some of it is grandfathered in. The flare is one of the concerns. If we were to do any significant changes to the flare, 
we would if we would have to move the flare and we'd have to move it towards actually where like the um, where actually Kurt had pointed out in the bunker away from to get it away from the road and the digesters. But at the moment we are in compliance because that flare was putting um, it was grandfathered in. Fair, we, no we've only done modifications to it. As far as the gas collection system, some of that's mixing. Um, we've lost some capability to do mixing. Um, so I think that's where that's brought up in there. And that's to do with some of the pipes, but it's not like there's methane gas leaking in the buildings right, right. Um, or any real safety hazard. So uh, to, if we were just going to go with the AI you know, and based energy um, side and not phase one, then we would be relying on the current infrastructure for gas collection and flaring. Correct. Mm -hmm. that's correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. I mean, I'm sure we'll have more time to discuss this, but I yep. just wanted to flag that as something I was interested in. Yep. Sure. Other thoughts? Yes. Um, this is maybe kind of a step backward, but just because I'm new to it, I want to, if, if it's okay, I want to lay out the, in very stupid language what I understand this whole thing to be, uh, and you can <laughs> check me. All of us. You can check me where I'm getting it wrong. Is that okay? Yes, please. So, okay. So, um, what I understand is we basically need to uh, fix the water resource recovery facility. That's the aging infrastructure. It's old. We need to fix it. That's expensive. To pay for it, we can uh, build further infrastructure so that we can take in more waste from surrounding communities, charge them money, and that will pay for some amount of the fixing we have to do anyway. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. correct. Beyond that, uh, once we start collecting all that waste, we'll be producing a lot more methane. And once we have all that methane, then we have the opportunity, potentially, to use it to create heat and power or some other alternative. Uh, to do that, we would have to build even more infrastructure, but we would get uh, a lot closer to our net zero goals. Yep. Yeah, we'll that, call that, that's the phase two portion of that's it. That's the phase two, build the CHP up, part. Yep, build up our digesters so right. we can handle it and then okay. evaluate it and look to potentials like CHP, combined heat and power, okay. producing electricity. That's what that really comes down to. Okay. And, and at the moment, what I'm hearing is that we might prefer to do it in two stages. We just do the uh, aging infrastructure and, and start collecting mm -hmm. waste, wait and see how much methane actually gets produced, and then move to, if we, if we so choose, then move to hit the, uh, the um, phase, two. phase two and, and utilizing our, methane. Right. And it was interesting to see the, the uh, CO2 reduction, that second line. Um, and all that is kind of an opportunity that's just come up in the, in the course of this. That was not, you didn't go out to find ways to, to reduce CO2. It, it came well, up. I think Chris and his team has been, have been doing so that for years. Yeah. That's why they got noticed. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it's, it's their staff, the staff's work that really got the recognition to the plant to get noticed by a company like ESG to have them reach out to the city. So, um, me at calling it to our yeah. attention as well. We're yeah. sort of looking for opportunities throughout the city. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John. It seems to me in some of the initial presentations, they talked about other places also going from organic to energy. If we delay further, we've already delayed and delayed this decision, is that going to put us behind, quote, our competition? Should we go to phase two? You mean right away? Well, I mean, because <laughs> we, we, we started this two years ago. I don't know. It seemed like a long time ago. You were educating me, Kurt. And so now I'm hearing another delay, that if we don't do phase one until November, then what's your timeline for phase two? And then I'm looking at... Again, the haulers, where are they going to go in the meantime? Are there going to be customers? Or are these other places that are thinking about or engaging in having the same sort of system, are they going to be taking those haulers? Mm -hmm. Phase one secures the haulers. Right. 
Okay. Phase Good. one secures Good. the haulers. Phase two, utilizing the gas that we're receiving by breaking down the material coming in our, in our digester. So phase one uh, secures the haulers. But as long as we stay in phase one, we're releasing, a, not capturing. A portion of it will be flared. Yeah. Not released, flared to. I mean, yes, I'm sorry. Appreciate that. Watch those words. <laughs> Watch those words. We're flared. Right. Mm -hmm. We'll also be using a lot of it for heating. Yep. So there's beneficial use to so the even, methane. Even without phase two. That's, I mean, that's right. What I, there will be that, beneficial use heating. of the methane as there is currently. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, for both the digesters and the buildings, we'll, we'll so use methane for heating. So you said like you want to try out a couple months. That's a couple months after phase one is. No, that's, that's right now. Monday. We're gonna start Monday. Monday. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yep. So if phase one went in, town meeting means the money doesn't come until. Well, if it's voted in November. When would we? If it was, act on if it right bond away? was passed November, then they could begin work or okay. begin putting it out to bid. They'd start construction when the weather broke in the spring. Right, okay. spring 2019. 2019, and then phase two, best scenario, what would phase two begin? Um, <laughs> Six months, four months? Oh, I'd say at least a year, yeah. A whole year, okay. You know, you know, That's my want to see how the plan operates and... Yep. Yeah, okay. want to make sure we have all that gas there to... Make sure we have the... Yep. Yep. The full year, okay. Capacity. Speak to the question Sure. Yeah. So I can speak. To, so in Vermont, as far as the municipal, there's only three wastewater facilities that are doing CHP currently. It's Essex Junction, Brattleboro, and South Burlington. Um, need, none of those facilities really take in that additional high strength waste or anything further. They just do the CHP on kind of a small scale because it's kind of a complement to what they're already doing. So, um, so they're not Montpelier wouldn't necessarily be competing with those facilities get that high strength waste, you know, if, if you waited to go into that second phase with the CHP emission. So like one of the potential customers was Ben and Jerry's and phase one would include them. Okay, and take but, care of yeah, them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Well, Rosie, two comments. One is that I thought that part of the contract that we we're contemplating signing put the onus on ESG to find the customers and if they didn't we were they, they would make us whole. I, is that still? Yeah. Um. <laughs> that, that's, there is, that hasn't yeah. changed, right? That's still. Well, everybody wants to talk. <laughs> yeah. well, you can have Larry speak to that. Sure. ESG. Yes. 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 Strange waste feed stock supplies, which can include acceptance, liquid sludge, Ben and Jerry's, fat soil and grease. Primary high strength waste categories will be for FOC, fat soil and grease, FOC, Ben and Jerry's. And there'll be a guarantee, well, two guarantees. There'll be a savings guarantee. So we talked about uh, reduction in landfilling, reduction in water use, reduction in energy. The other side of that is revenue, which one would come from receive additional high strength waste. The second category would be revenue from the sale of power. Now one of the questions was timing on CHP. I think one of the things that would happen and it would be a city decision is from a due diligence standpoint, you have to go through an RFP process that Debbie runs for the utility commission. Usually around April um, of each year we put out an RFP. Uh, so we were going to look for this period now to start positioning and lobbying, lobbying to try to get, I don't get into the weeds on it, if we want to, but there's technology set aside. So they have had, I don't think they've had any biomethane request for this renewable feeding power. Most of it's been solar and wind. Uh, and they've got categories for farm, you know, which, they, which has happened in the past. So there's an interest in biomethane. So they're, all, they're competitive proposals. The city would have to put in their proposal and propose price that they want to have over the long term, so 20 year term, for uh, essentially a price per kilowatt hour for that 20 year period. So the process would be over that year is to position, try to lobby, and get that set aside. And then it's still not a certainty. There's still the potential of somebody, but from our discussions, it's, you know, 
think I, I think we use the term reasonable or work reasonable level of confidence that the city would be the only applicant for a biomethane set aside. And they give that range, 12 and a half cents a kilowatt hour is what they call the cap. And that may change next year. But right now it's 12 and a half cents. So to get back to the question, yes, there's going to be a revenue guarantee associated with the high strength waste that combined with the other savings covers the cost of the additional work associated with the additional energy work. Just to be clear, lobbying is lobbying the legislature, right? Because that set aside, I believe, is in statute. Twenty. I'm using the term that be used, but essentially working, approaching PUC, starting off with a letter. I think it was suggested that uh, in our conversation uh, from Bepi, they said you guys should start off with either a letter from the mayor's office or city council or public works, send in a letter to PUC talking about what the, the city's intentions are with the project and really just getting on the radar, whatever activities would follow from that. So it would be... Oh, it, would be like, it would be with the PUC. I want to look into that more because I'm having a hard time recalling. I had done a bunch of digging into that before, and I believe at that point that the set-asides were dictated by statute, and so we would have had to get a legislative change, but I may yeah. – that may not be correct. So I'm going to do some follow-up research and hope that city staff would do that as well. Just the set-aside, but the capacity within the – I think they're there, but whether or not they get – I just want to make sure that we know who we're talking about lobbying and <laughs> how successful we think we might be. So, um, My second question, um, just briefly, was about odor. Is there any impact on odor either way with this project? Yeah, so that's, that's another reason for the pilot study. Okay. Is, um, we do have some concerns about that. There's, there's ways to mitigate it with the different types of chemical addition, um, but we are going to um, monitor that as well when we do this pilot study. Oh, uh, comments. Yes. Comments? Yes, please. <laughs> so I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm a member of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. And um, I was here a couple weeks ago to, to give you all an update about the city's net zero goals. And I just wanted to kind of zoom out from a lot of the details and give try and give a little bit of context to the, the this project and, and what the kind of impact it could have towards the city's net zero goals. So you know, when we presented or a few weeks ago, we talked about there's three real buckets that we're trying to reduce in terms of energy use, transportation, heating, and electricity. And this is a project that has the potential to have a significant impact in two of those buckets, in heating and electricity. Um, you know, they, in, in either of these OE options, they are going to be producing more methane and basically maybe not eliminating 100% of the fuel oil use, but 90% is what you're proposing. So um, they use about 10,000 gallons of fuel oil every year for heating the plant. And so we'd be taking a big chunk out of that fuel oil bill um, and our just overall fossil fuel use for the city operations. And then, you know, it's, it's great to talk about the electricity and the dollar value of that electricity, and you see that in all the graphs. But I just want to give, like, a little bit of context of like how much electricity is that? Well, you know, two years ago we did a one megawatt solar project for the city and the school district, and this will produce more electricity than that. So it's more than the one megawatt of solar. Um, and it would, you know, those two combined, we would be net zero electric. You know, I, there, there's details about does it count? But we would be in the city. Uh, we would know it counted. Right. Producing <laughs> renewable electricity at a large scale. So I just want to throw that out because I think um, we can talk about producing power, but is it like a little bit of power? Or is it a lot? It's a lot of power. So that's just my two cents. I think there's other folks from the Energy Committee. Now. Other, other comments? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Carl Johnson. I'm I know some of you, and um, some I don't. I've, I've served on several committees for the city, including the Appraisal Committee and the Budget Review Committee, and uh, been involved in energy throughout my career. Um, worked uh, all over the world on different kinds of energy projects. I currently consult on renewables and efficiency, but I've also been involved in a couple of dozen CHP projects, including uh, biogas. I, 
I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, the city of Montpelier is very fortunate to have a really excellent team working on this project, uh, from DPW, the consultants, uh, ESG, certainly the, the Energy Committee, but all said uh, professional, respectful, moving forward, it's really impressive. Um, I think that this project has a lot of potential, and I think that in part, in total, really, because of the team, it's come a long way already. The development process is just that, it's a process, not an event. Going forward, I think the phased approach is spot on. We have the opportunity to address RECs and the contract for the power. We have an opportunity to look at additional capacity for use of the energy, and whether it's in the gas or whether it's in thermal energy, uh, there's some value there that we might be able to realize. So, uh, you know, working on this in a phased approach is the right approach, it's the way to maximize value and to minimize risk. The project's really structured very well. The city has opportunities to walk away if, if something goes south. Uh, it's, it's a well-structured project. There is some opportunity cost. There's environmental opportunity cost of waiting. There's financial opportunity cost. You've alluded to competition as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I think the Energy Committee is eager to help answer any questions as we advise the council. So I want you to suggest, uh, consider including the costs of getting to net zero as you evaluate these options. In one option, you, you don't get to net zero at all, and as you progress looking at the other options, in some cases you get closer. So just if the city council is interested in the net zero policy, just consider the cost of getting to net zero when you consider each one of these options. And I'm not criticizing the cost of that isn't necessarily accounted for in all the options, but that's one way that the council can address it from a high level. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, did you want to say anything? Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Talk to Mr. I will just say, I mean, we were, you know, responsible for the initial opportunity that came. And I just still think it's a it's a great opportunity. It's a uh, it's a huge undertaking. So you guys have a lot of work to do. Uh, but the people who are working for you, I think, have pretty well laid out your options. And the doing nothing option really makes very little sense when you look at the other options. So I, I, I still say it's a great opportunity. I know you have a lot on your plate. I know you'll do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so thank you all for for your work on this um i'm just thinking about our, our next steps like when it's the next time that we might be seeing you um i mean i know you're going to do this pilot and you have some you all have some more work to do uh when might we see you back here um i don't want to set a date exactly <laughs> but it's probably midsummer or something like that mid <laughs> yeah midsummer midsummer okay great okay. perfect awesome any other comments from council Oh, Donna. I would like to have your slide presentation. I, I find the more information I get in different ways, it highlights it for me. So they were sent out. It's been emailed. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you all. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So on our walking through all the departments, uh, we are up to the uh, planning and community development department and their presentation. So welcome, Mike. Including the Planning Commission. And, uh, right, including the Planning Commission. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you have a presentation? I do. Oh, okay. I'm going to move it. It'll be quick. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe we can take five minutes sure. uh, to get things together and take a break. But... Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to bring you back together here, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. So I am Mike Miller, I'm the planning director, and I've got a short presentation. So uh, technically I'm here representing two departments, so planning and community development, as well as building and health, technically two separate de uh, departments. Um, we also have members of the planning commission here, housing task force, yeah. uh, maybe a couple other people that snuck in on me. <laughs> um, our energy folks laughed. Um, so the organizational chart, uh, 
unlike DPW and the ones you saw two weeks ago who had 36 employees, we have four, including myself. Uh, Meredith is our new part-time zoning administrator. Uh, she just started last week. We also have uh, Audra Brown, many of you know. Uh, she's the planning and zoning assistant and community development specialist Kevin Casey, who is behind me. The building in health is a little bit different because it actually has uh, both Chief Gallons and I are co-directors, I guess, of the building and health department, uh, which has one employee, Chris Lumbra. So usually Chief Gallons backs up Chris as the health officer, and I tend to oversee more of the administrative side of the department. So what do we do? What does the planning department do? Uh, we talk about things in, the f in four Ps. Uh, most people think of, well, you guys are planning and zoning. But it really, we kind of look at it breaking into four different things. We've got planning. We've got permitting. But then we also have programs and projects. So planning is the obvious things. We do public outreach and studies to find out what the public wants, what are our goals, what problems need to be solved. Uh, the master plan update, complete streets, parking strategy, housing strategy, EDSP, these are all planning things. What, what do we need? How do we want to try to solve our problems? Um, the other three are really how we accomplish our goals. So we have a set of goals and we accomplish them through permitting. We, we regulate people, building permits, zoning permits, flood hazard regulations, E911, road numbering, junk cars, public nuisance. These are all just the ones that are in my department. But this works across the city as well. Other, um, other departments will also use these same types of things. They might not, might not think about it this way, but this is kind of a good way to, to orient yourself to different things. Um, programs and projects differ in that they're non-regulatory. Um, projects are things, I'll do them a little, a little out of order, projects you do once. So we're going to build uh, one, one Taylor Street. We're going to build one French block. Um, you know, these, these are specific projects that are going on. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places update, pretty much anything in your CIP, these are all projects, things that we do once. Programs are things that we're going to do over and over. Um, first time home buyer program. We're not just going to issue one and we're done. We're going to continue to do this over and over. Housing preservation grants, sprinkler tax credits. Uh, there are a lot of programs that go through our office and um, in other offices, as I said, different, different places have these. Um, and uh, the other piece I'll point out is with the projects is, you know, two weeks ago you met with DPW who they are the experts in projects. They do these all the time. Tom talked about doing projects as a five-step thing uh, and taking between three and seven years to complete. I usually talk about them in three steps just by lumping some of them together, and I usually talk about three to five years at a minimum. So usually I usually do it for three because you've got planning, preparing, and implementing. So if you want to do a project, you're going to spend one year planning, one year preparing, and one year implementing, and that's if everything goes right and you set things out. So usually we're talking about things, breaking things into those three-year periods to try to get these big projects done. And obviously larger projects will take even longer. So we had five people we talked about who's, who's doing what. Uh, so my primary responsibility, in addition to being the director, is um, the planning side of things. I staff the planning commission. We've got a new city plan we want to work on. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, the Meredith spends nearly all of her time on permitting, although there are some planning responsibilities to staff the Historic Preservation Commission. Audra also spends nearly all of her time on permitting, although she runs the uh, community rating system, which is the flood hazard program through FEMA that gives all residents of the city a discount on their flood insurance. It's very expensive, uh, and we'll, I'll touch on that again a little bit later on. The building inspector spends all his time on permitting. That's it. Um, he does that, including the public nuisance ordinance and the junk car ordinance. And Kevin. Unlike the others, Kevin um, spends all of his time on the programs and projects. So when we start looking at who's doing planning, who's doing programs, and who's doing projects, it's usually just the, the two of us. And he runs the revolving loan funds, the first-time home buyers. He does grant administration. Uh, that's his, quote, community development uh, side, where uh, one Taylor Street, Taylor Street, French Block, uh, BBB, Barry Baldwin. 
Yeah, but um, and complete streets, public arts. So there are a couple of different projects um, that go through the, the programs and projects. So you guys are going to be jumping into your strategic planning. So one thing I would um, go and say is just try to think about these four Ps. It's a very helpful way of uh, kind of organizing your thoughts. If you focus in strategic planning on what you want to see, what is your vision, what is your problem what is that you want to solve, um, that's a key piece to make sure um, kind of gets uh, focused in on is the planning side. Because your permits, programs, and projects are how you're going to get things done. And that's where you can use staff to evaluate your alternatives, um, whether that's you know, um, the planning staff or whether it's DPW, whether it's public safety, whatever your, your issue is you want to address, use your staff to help come up with the, these permits, programs, and projects and how we're going to do it. And then, of course, always continue. Um, we're going to have a city plan update. The second time I've mentioned that, we'll come back to that as a good place to talk about how to implement goals. And um, the big projects, you know, what ribbon cutting do you want to be in 2021? And I know that's always hard to go and say, well, we don't, we don't want to be talking about 2021. We want to talk about this year and what's coming up. But for whether you're talking to Tom or whether you're talking to me, we're always looking at 2021. That's three years. That's the fastest we'll get a project done. Um, and that gives us the room to start looking for and isolating funding for grants and other ways to, to defray costs and to make these projects run much smoother. Uh, so things, other things for you to think about with the strategic planning is keep in mind that, that from the planning department, we have some limited staff. Um, three of our staff are heavily dedicated to the permits, and only two are dedicated to planning and programs. And you'll also have uh, the manager's office. So we really have Bill, Sue, Kevin, and myself who really tend to be the ones who address a lot of the 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 goals that come up in some of the different ideas. So just keep those in mind. So if we turn the lights on, where's everybody at? We're talking about planning. Um, it's tough. It's tough. It's late. Um, but we're halfway done. That was my halfway done slide. So planning. Well, I just I know these. It gets wait till we get to slide 13, and I'll see where everybody's at. <laughs> um, so, with planning, what have what are some of the recent accomplishments? Is especially for some of the new counselors. Um, you missed out last year on the zoning and river hazard adoption, <laughs> the master plan adoption and readoption. That was that was a lot of work last year. Uh, underway this year, we still have the complete streets plan. The yeah, NEA actually get half credit. That was a cut. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the public arts, CLGs, uh, some of the permit things we've got um, recently. We did increase the part-time zoning administrator from 0.5 to 0.8 over the past three years. That's been very helpful. Uh, permits are way up. We, we're currently, as of May 1st, at 177% for zoning fees and 106% for building fees. And this is the busiest time. So we're going to probably easily double the, the zoning fees and building fees. Is, that's up from last year? Uh, that's from what was budgeted. We increased the budget, and then we've overshot the budget by 77% so far. So I asked to get the actual permit numbers, and Audra wasn't able to get me those numbers. She was busy. <laughs> was customer, customer service. Oh, uh, building and Health Department uh, continues to pay for itself. It's a department that uh, actually is self-sufficient when it comes to fees. It collects as much fees as it needs to, to support itself. So some recent accomplishments, the community rating system, which I mentioned earlier, that Audra runs, that saves uh, property owners $30,500 annually on flood insurance premiums. If we did some work and had uh, some resources, we could reapply and go from what's a rating of nine to a rating of eight, and we could double that to sixty-one thousand dollars. It's just a matter of trying to get cut cut out enough time to put that paperwork and get it into FEMA. Um, we've also received, and it, this is an old slide saying five hundred thousand dollars for French Block. I'm, I would bet it's probably more by now. Um, the old Brown Derby that actually probably is more of a permit piece, but that was torn down due to enforcement action by the council and due to the work of the building inspector. 
Um, but the building inspector also assisted in getting two other blighted properties uh, resolved without having to go through the enforcement action. And the projects we have completed, the DR2 projects, and uh, the historic update was uh, another one that we'd been working on for a number of years. What's DR2? DR2, that was Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery 2. Okay. Thank and you. It's about that helpful, yes. Yeah, it's a Hurricane Irene. We got funding from Hurricane Irene, and uh, so the state was able to apply and loan out a bunch of money. They had some money left over and got a second allocation. We applied for and received some money in the second allocation. Opportunities and challenges. So we continue to build bridges to other departments. So we, we have, over the past couple of years, tried to start to build bridges to other departments, including DPW. They're just across the hall from us. Uh, they do a lot of reviews of our zoning regulations. When zoning permits come in, we give them to them. They review them for the technical pieces. And we're also trying to help them by administering their, their permits. So we are more of a one-stop shop. If you need a curb, curb cut, instead of coming to the planning department and we send you over to talk to DPW, we actually will just go and accept the application for the curb cut, and then we walk it across the hall and give it to them to approve. And then we can issue it. We handle more of the administrative pieces for them. Um, we also have files on all the properties, so we can file them as well. Um, we are working on uh, trying to do more grant writing and admin for DPW where it makes sense. Uh, it's, uh, there's a, a number of grants that they just can run in-house, but in some cases we've tried with ERP, which is Ecosystem Restoration Program, and a couple others where we're trying to kind of reach out using Kevin's skills to administer some grants to because they don't need to be using their engineering staff to be doing grant administration, while at the same time we, we're good at grant administration and grant writing, um, we could use them to help us with project management when it comes to constructing a project. So we're trying to build some good bridges. Um, we're also working as an opportunity to reorganize our revolving loan funds. We actually hope you'll get to see something about this coming up, maybe later in the spring or summer. Um, we have a set of revolving loan funds for housing, uh, economic development, and ADA. They're all currently tied up with uh, state and federal rules and we actually can release them, we just have to go through a process and Kevin's working on that and that will make that those funding more flexible and we can target it to programs better. A couple of quick challenges, uh, we, we are still short staffed um, from time to time leaving no coverage on permits on days, Chris spends most of his time in the field um, and Meredith is part time and if Audra takes a vacation, people come in, there's a chance there's not going to be anyone there to help them. It's something we try to minimize and uh, it's it's disappointing we like that we like to keep people in there that's one of our challenges and some staff limits as it as it comes to tackling bigger initiatives um, a number of initiatives that can be tackled but there's only a certain number of initiatives we can tackle at any one time so so the planning commission and city plan update uh, the planning commission has three priorities for this year um, they're obviously just as excited as you guys are to have the, the zoning and the master plan done. The big items that they're, they're going to try to work on is the official map. This was kind of in coordination with the Conservation and Parks Commission. Uh, we had, with the discussions of some of the open, open space protections, we needed to address um, an official map, so we said we would help them with that, so we are. Zoning fixes is a second one uh, that we need to to get in. We just adopted the new zoning, and we're finding little tweaks here and there that kind of need to go through. We're going to probably get that to the council, to you guys, sometime in the summer. This shouldn't be anything to get really worried about. Most of these are going to be little things that when we point out, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. We didn't mean that. The Planning Commission didn't mean that, but that's what it says. The big one is the Planning Commission wants to kickstart the new city plan update. So the goal of the city plan update, um, as many of you remember, there, there's a false start we had on this about two years ago. Um, and the goal is not necessarily to go back and redo the visioning that took place in 2009, but rather to revisit implementation. And um, how could we be more strategic 
with our, our planning. There is also a strong desire to make this more of a 21st century document, making it online, making it more interactive, uh, have summaries and explanations with links. If people want to understand more and read more, they can kind of drill down in if it's an online type product. We would still need to have a printed plan, but it would be shorter and much more of a summary. And uh, unlike the current, how the current plan is arranged, we would use a more traditional breakout of chapters that would correspond to committees, and each committee would help to develop their own plan. So we would be looking at, you know, the energy committee should be helping us with the energy chapter. Uh, transportation should be helping with the transportation chapter. Historic, natural resources, housing. Uh, it it kind of makes sense, but that's not how our current plan is organized. So it, it, by breaking, it out, breaking them back out, we would end up with a plan that could more easily um, be, when, when we start talking about how are we going to implement the energy chapter, it should go to the energy committee who knows how they're going to um, accomplish the goals. So the proposed process, what are we, what was the planning commission? They've, they've talked about this and what ideas that kind of came out was they wanted to have an all committees kickoff uh, sometime late in the spring, maybe early in the summer, it really kind of depends how we can get the schedules to fit. Uh, and staff will be working on committees on goals and strategies and then work back to the text uh, in a, in a um, little bit of a backwards way. Because what we want to do is to um, make sure that we're not just talking about things just to talk about things when we have the written text. We really want to be going and saying, we, we want both pieces to kind of work together. And a lot of times you write the text and then separately you write the goals and policies and they, they don't really reflect each other. And we really want to make sure that they are working together to tell, to tell the story that we want to tell about housing or about energy. And so the other piece of the all committees um, process uh, is to invite all the committees. Um, everybody needs to know um, what every you know that that things are being worked on. And let me try to explain that. Um, we have different goals. Let's say, say public transportation. Who's going to be responsible for public transportation? Is it the transportation committee? Is it the energy committee? Is it community services? Uh, you can kind of look at the same idea in three different ways. Energy efficiency in rental housing. Who's working on that? Is that a housing goal or is that an energy goal? So bringing all the committees together gives us the opportunity to start to go and say, we see everybody's goals. We now have to start having this conversation about um, how we're going to do it and what your goals are, because in some cases, goals are going to conflict. Um, perhaps economic development and protection of open space, or housing and open space, may end up being a conflict. And we're going to have committees, one committee that's going to be pushing hard for one that may be conflicting with another committee that's pushing hard. It's the planning commission that's going to be coming in and kind of being the initial arbiter, and you guys would be the final arbiter at the end. But we want to have this initial kickoff meeting because we want people to understand, the committee's chairs to understand that we're going to work on this and we're going to have to resolve these conflicts. We're going to have to decide who's, who's tackling which issues and ultimately what's going to happen when the two different goals uh, conflict with each other. And as long as we all understand at the front that's how we're going to do it, then, then we hope it becomes more of, much more of a collaborative process. Um, so the other piece is obviously connecting, connecting actions to goals, uh, being deliberate. We want to try to really have hard discussions about goals and how we implement those goals. We don't want to encourage accessory apartments. Encouraging accessory apartments will create zero accessory apartments. What we want to do is to actually create accessory apartments, and how are we going to do that? What is the actual program, what's the actual action step that's going to help us get there? Or whatever that goal is, we want to try to get away from encouraging economic development. I don't want to encourage economic development. Tell us what, what, what's the goal specifically. We want to create more jobs, or do we want to grow the grand list? And once we know specifically what our target is, what's our benchmark, then we can start coming up with a program that says, you know, maybe tax stabilization is good, maybe tax stabilization isn't good. Maybe um, some other programs would be more appropriate. So that's kind of the idea, is we want to be very deliberate about our programs. So because I do find, looking at a lot of the programs that we have today, some of them 
aren't being effective because they're just, they were just kind of an, a program created in isolation. Um, a historic or a housing preservation grant that you're only eligible for if you're not eligible to get money from a bank. So we're loaning money to people who don't have any chance of paying us back. It's, you know, is that the best use of this set of funds? Maybe it's yes, maybe that program needs to be tweaked to better um, facilitate the goal or the outcome that we want. So before you leave this slide, Mike, mm -hmm. I just felt being delivered was a very clear direction to the council. <laughs> I don't know if other council members related to that, but it's a good one, but I thought, oh, he nailed it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a word I like when, when talking about this. It, it's just we don't want to be, we, we, when you have limited staff and you have oh, limited no, resources, be very direct with how, exactly how we're going to spend our time because we want ultimately to be looking back two years now, three years from now to say, here's where we started, we've gotten this far. Um, so the final takeaways. So we're your planning department. We are here to, to help plan and implement those plans. Uh, identify alternatives and make recommendations to you. Uh, we count on you to establish goals and identify problems. Um, you know, we need to find out from you what the issues are so we can help to solve them. We need you guys to provide us the resources we need uh, and to prioritize the goals when there aren't sufficient resources. Um, and many times that's, that's a difficult one when we have a number of great ideas and just the staff, you know, five great ideas and enough staff to do three of them. We can do a little bit on all five and not get any of them done, or we can prioritize a couple of them to try to make sure we can get um, progress on a few. Um, you guys have the hard job. You guys got to make the decisions. I'm, I'm only here to give you recommendations and advice. You guys have the hard job to make the decisions. Um, and then the last thing is to stay committed to projects. As we pointed out, they take, you know, three to three to five years um, if we're on again, off again, it, it takes the momentum out of a project. So uh, those were the things that we would uh, count on you guys to kind of help with. And uh, we would ask you to support the city plan proposal, which is we're looking for you to kind of give us the green light that says you're interested in having the planning commission and the planning staff work on uh, the city plan update. We don't have to. It's valid for another eight years. We think it's uh, a good use of staff time. We don't have a grant. We're just working on it with staff time. But um, it's a. I used to be a consultant. I can do this, and uh, I think it would be a good use of the city's time for us to to really start working on the city plan and putting that effort in. And I'll take your questions. <laughs> That's my Ruby. You're determined to put us to sleep, aren't you? Yes. Uh, there's no room to sleep there. No. <laughs> No, he didn't give it to us, and he wanted to surprise us. Yes. Okay. Questions? I know we've sort of been yeah, asking you. <laughs> um, I'm curious about that increase in, in zoning um, and building permits, and mm -hmm. wondering if you've got any sense of is that just due to the zoning changes we made, or is that a different building climate, or is it just just happens? Uh, I think it's going to probably be, because a lot of these actually started before, I would probably be more likely to say it's a little bit of a, more of a climate. But it certainly has made a difference in some, some of the permits we're getting now. A handful of permits we received because the zoning was coming and they wanted to get in because they wouldn't be allowed to do it after. <laughs> A couple of people, like Timber Homes, um, intentionally had been waiting to, to kind of get that to go. So um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've had this kind of ongoing discussion about um, staffing and that there may be a need, especially if we see an uptick, uh, uptick in um, building for additional staff um, and I'm just curious what the status of that is right now. Um, and the hope being, of course, that the fees could fund that additional staff. Um, it is, um, he has the busiest, I mean, even though you'll look and see that it's, um, the zoning fees are actually higher and farther along than, than the building fees. I, I would say Chris's schedule is probably the busiest. 
if we get if we get lucky, um, we'll get one more big fee because one Taylor Street hasn't dropped in their permit. So if they do, we'll probably end up doubling that. We'll we'll have eighty thousand more fees for for that. So it's possible, but that's that those are more one-time funds. I don't I wouldn't count on it being consistent every year that we're going to double those fees, but we will for a short time. This year's was big because of French Block. Um, last year's from Caledonia Spirits. Um, hotel next year. We'll get the hotel next year, um, so that'll be big. So there, there will be some, I think, that come in, uh, and I think the chief is going in to get certified mm -hmm. as a building inspector, so we may be, we're trying to work with options that won't require that. But. Okay, I just want to keep an eye on that. Yeah, it is, yeah, I, I keep an eye on it too. <laughs> Um, I have a couple questions, unless other people. Uh, so, uh, just coming back to the city plan. Uh, so, I mean, I from the um, list that you gave us, there were five committees. Uh, are there more? Are there five chapters? Are there more than five chapters? Uh, They're going to probably be more. I just put that was just a, a quick snapshot okay. of five of them. Okay. Um, there's t 10, 10 or twelve required elements. Most okay. of which that have committees. Um, I would, I would love to see. Uh, once we know where they're all going, I would just. I mean, you don't even. For my purposes, I mean, you don't even necessarily need to come back and tell us. But even if we just had an email that said, "Here's where all the chapters are going to start," and um, uh, and roughly, uh, I mean, my understanding right is that so they they start in these committees and then they go to the planning commission um, for a review. Do you want to come? Up and Please do. Yeah. Please do. I didn't want to interrupt Mike's presentation. That's, sorry, let's. It had a nice that. flow to it with all the dogs. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm Leslie Welts. I'm the chair of the Planning Commission, and I've I've met probably all of you. I think I've met you yet, but everyone <laughs> else. Um, and I've been on the. I just looked it up because I couldn't recall. But I've been on the Planning Commission since August 2014, and I've been chair since January 2017. Um, and a lot has happened at that time, as you all know. Uh, and now we're, we're really excited to be able to turn our attention to focusing on developing a city plan. Um, and that's what Mike has really done a great job presenting why we want to go there, what, what we want to talk about. But one detail I want to elaborate on is the process that we have put forward as a proposed process to, to kick off this process. So we initially thought, well, maybe we'll build chapter chapters one by one in each committee, and then we'll put them all together and see how it shakes out. And um, we got some feedback from the Energy Committee, which was going to or they no, they weren't going to be our first committee actually, but they were very pretty far down the road with drafting a chapter already. That it would be really useful to get mm -hmm. input from the other committees on their goals so that they could tailor, the Energy Committee could sort of have that in mind as they tailored their own goals. And we thought this is a great idea to get everybody in the room, talk about three goals, three to five goals that all the committees have, um, give them, you know, five minutes to talk each committee, and we were all, in, and then that way we would just have a broad sense in a comprehensive way of what, what are the, what's the universe of goals we're talking about here. Um, and then I think being in the room with all the other committee members would help people to realize that nobody's trying to undermine their goals and that we all, we just have to figure out how to prioritize. So this would help sort of set the tone for the whole city plan adoption process of we're working together, we realize there are a lot of different goals we want to accomplish, some of them may conflict, but we've just got to work to prioritize. So. That, that's the proposed process. Um, and the way that we're thinking this would go forward is I would draft a letter to the various committees inviting them to this event, lay out the format of the event, have it someplace we were thinking um, in the Lost Nation Theater space upstairs. Um, but I haven't done any legwork on that. It was just sort of a thought <laughs> that, that we've had. Um, and we would do this with enough time, advanced time, that committees that haven't discussed goals very much will have an opportunity to meet and have that discussion at a, at a very high level. 
Um, so it would be June at the earliest. Um, we might be talking late June, just to ensure that all the committees have time to meet since some of them only meet once a month. Um, so that, that is the proposal that we have. Um, we haven't done any of that yet, and I don't think any of the committees are even aware of this proposal. <laughs> they will get a letter if we, if we do move forward with this. Um, one of the concerns we had is we just wanted to make sure that the planning department had adequate staff time to help us with kicking this process off because, as you saw, there are a lot of demands on their time, and we wanted to be sure that the council wanted to prioritize the city plan before we move forward on that. So that's why we've brought that forward. That's the thought. Once we have that initial meeting with everyone, then we can see what we have and, and make another plan for moving forward. Um, and it might make sense at that point to come back and check in with the council and, and give some feedback. So I love that idea of having a time for all the committees who might want to be uh, ultimately authoring some of these chapters to come together and share initial thoughts. Um, I think that would be great. I mean, and I, I'm sure the public will want to go and weigh in, and I trust your ability to like navigate all of that. So, uh, but I think, you know, being intentional about inviting the, the public to that and, um, and in some form giving them a voice in that process as well. I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there's a way to, to figure that out. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think that sounds best. like a great, a great process. And, um, you know, when I saw your, your slides, Mike, I was a little surprised to see that, you know, final adoption would be in two or three years. Um, perhaps this is, I mean, I thought it would be faster, um, but, uh, you know, especially given that, I mean, I wonder if June is, or late June is too soon, you know, if give people a couple of meetings to talk about what they want for their goals and then, but I don't, I don't know, I mean. Maybe whatever. it makes sense to have two of these events, one where we hear the initial goals and then they can go back to the committee, discuss do we want to revamp this at all and then come back and yeah. have a second meeting like that. And it feels a little bit like overkill, but it might actually streamline the rest of the process. Yeah. Other thoughts on this? <coughs> You're looking for a strong message from us that we support you going ahead with this and spending, dedicating the staff time to it. Yes, please. <laughs> I Thank am you willing for to articulate to that. Um, and I, I think that we should give them the message or the response of I'm trying to create a motion in my head that that would get to that I'm not sure what that motion would be but I I'm there also I agree we please don't I don't know if we necessarily need a motion just the, the <laughs> knowing you've got the, the yes. support of yes. uh, us to move forward on that and no. just just to address a little bit on the, the timing um, just remember it took it took an entire year just to review the zoning so Fair. when we talk about <laughs> if it takes three years to get to adoption, it, we may spend an entire year just going through the hearing process, hearing people's concerns about whether this goal is really the right goal and whether that should be tweaked to be this goal. And then we have another hearing and another meeting, and so, you can see how this takes a year. Uh, it seems to me that this makes sense for um, the Planning Commission to be their top priority. Um, I just want to recognize, too, that other things that we have talked about um, – on the council, which I think will probably come up in our strategic planning time, retreat time, uh, is reopening or looking at our ordinances. And I know that that will take uh, probably some staff time as well uh, from the, the department. So um, I'm not sure how that balance will shake out or what the need for balance there will be, but uh, I think that's something we can talk about at our, our retreat. And yeah, we wanted to make sure we got to you before the, the staff retreat as well, just so as you're having the retreat, you can decide whether afterwards, we've got a few more things in we, that we'd like planning staff to be working on. Yep. And okay. we may have to roll the city plan back a little bit or scale it back because we want to prioritize something else. We just wanted to make sure it was out there to go and say, this is what we'd like to work on, and we could certainly adjust mm -hmm. our work plan to reflect okay. what your goals are. Okay. So I was actually going to try to figure out a more delicate way to ask that question is that you put it like that. So you're not necessarily looking for the firm commitment from the council tonight. You just want to make sure you get a clear message from them in the next two weeks about where the city plan stands. Is that? Yeah. I mean, we if, if we got a firm commitment tonight, I would be a little bit worried that when you sit down to have your strategic plan that you might have boxed yourself in a little bit. But yeah. 
Okay, well, that's good to know going into that. So I saw Donna and then Jack. Well, I think this kind of event of these committees coming together where you really <coughs> want to get out of your silos and hear and each of them somewhat integrate the other, per other perspective, it seems you really need a good facilitator. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we should look at that and, and, and add to the staff because it's a, it's a specialty. And it also wouldn't take, would we help supplement the staff time to do this event and follow up. And I, I think it'd be really worth looking at and us thinking about some additional money to do it. And I think regardless of the, the strategic planning process, yeah. we, would, <laughs> we would probably, we're gonna do this event anyways. So even if, even if it were like, well, gee, we should slow down a little bit because we've got some other priorities. This is still a priority for, this, for the planning commission to have this meeting and to, to bring everybody together. It's just whether this is a plan that we try to develop in two years and then have hearings, or whether it's something that takes three years to have hearings. It really depends on how many other things we're working on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we already know how busy 219 and 220 are going to be, Mike. <laughs> Every year is going to be busy, right? <laughs> From I, I think that this commitment from the council is the kind of thing you're looking maybe as part of the prod, product of our planning retreat in a couple of weeks. And uh, I think this is great. We talked about this event uh, at the last housing task force meeting. People were very uh, enthusiastic about it. And I would guess that the other committees are similarly enthusiastic. I am personally. It was the energy committee. I have to give them credit. They came up with the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just thought it was good. <laughs> well, we, we had such good luck when we did it with all the transportation, bike, pedestrian, energy. It really, it really helped everyone share. But I, uh, one of my questions is, one of the things I'm going to bring up in my council report is parks. I still think our parks and our park commission sits aside. It needs to be integrated. So please have them, the commission, and any of their subgroups uh, on your list to be included. Yeah, they're they're already involved in the um, official map process. So we've I've already been meeting with them um, because they've been a key part of that official map. And so they're already in, and they'll they'll obviously um, they actually asked um, to be one of when we were talking about this as pilot. We're going to do one chapter, two chapters, or three chapters this year. When we were talking about doing it in pieces. They had asked to be one of the parks, wanted to be one of the priority chapters, um, to be one of the first ones done. So there's certainly an interest in that in that group about trying to get that conversation going about um, parks and open space and trying to, to keep that process moving or we'll, get that process started. We'll be sure to invite them and make sure they're part of the process. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, yes. Nicole and along with Jen Holler, the co chairs of the Housing Task Force, and I just said three quick things. Um, one is to um, echo what Jack said for either the work that the Planning um, Commission and the Planning Department on the master plan. Um, I also just wanted to say how grateful we are um, to the department um, for Kevin's help. He comes to all of our meetings provides us with support, information, and it's just absolutely invaluable um, for, for us to do what we do. And um, the third thing is we would like to come back um, sometime after your strategic plan, if there's time, talk a little bit more about housing, maybe do some um, education for some of the, the newer council members, and also continue the conversation that was begun with the last city council about a sustainable uh, funding source for the uh, monthly housing test, which is a really great resource that helps um, get some of the housing that the city needs. Thank you. Um, other comments or questions? Okay, great. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. All your work. Looking forward to <coughs> chatting again. All right.
so thanks to the planning commission the for there. They're probably still in PTSD from last year. <laughs> <laughs> We're ready for the next thing. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. Okay, now I'll have kids. <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're on to council reports. So I think I forget where we I think we started there last time. So uh, um, I have been extremely busy with work for the last uh, few weeks, but have returned and have no more work travel lined up in the next few weeks. So I'm very excited to get a little bit more engaged. Um, and I have lots of folks I need to respond to emails on, and I apologize for, for not being, um, having my head quite here, but I'm back. <laughs> All right. um, and uh, I did want to mention that I have been feeling a little um, disconnected from the Montpelier business community as some of these um, recent issues have come up, and so I've been thinking about how to um, connect a little bit more, and so I'm going to work, um, reach out to city staff about attending some of the um, MBA meetings or, or somehow um, be a little bit more accessible um, and so I want to kind of open that up that I'm something I'm thinking about and interested in want to, to do more on so. first Wednesday 830 here <coughs> I maybe should have said this when the uh, guys from the water resource recovery facility were still here but I just had the opportunity to go on tours of the uh, town garage, the water plant, the water resource recovery facility, and uniformly, I would say I'm extremely impressed with the quality of the people who are working for the city in these uh, capacities, the intelligence and dedication they bring to their jobs, and I think the city is very lucky to have everyone working for them that that we've met on these on these tours mm -hmm. Great. thank you um, I have been thinking about this for a bit now but as I uh, drove to Norwich for my last class um, and took the detour I can't believe how far we've come I mean I was elected to this body uh, just over a year ago and we had so much work to do uh, and I just I really want to commend city staff um, for all of that work I mean I know the, the planning department has under <laughs> undertaken and endeavored a huge amount of work to, to make a lot of these things happen um, you know we had the Brown Derby and then uh, a huge number of other projects that DPW has also been involved with now uh, on Route 12, the paving as well. And it's really exciting to see all of the things that are are, are taking shape here in Montpelier. And uh, I'm really grateful to be a part of that. Uh, <coughs> I definitely feel the park and the park commissions are being neglected. And I would like for the city council to consider having an appointed person to be a liaison with the plant park commission. And I, I certainly am interested, but any of us would be better than nobody right now. Uh, I've gone to quite a few of their meetings, and, and unless there's a big controversy, it's really, um, I feel, the lack of support there from the rest of us in the, in the community for their work. But I'd also really like to see us tackle getting parks throughout the city. And I have a vision even of what I call a pretty park where you can go and sit and there's bushes and flowers and places for toddlers to play. Um, just something small and compact and not just always, it's wonderful that we have our big parks, but it doesn't fit the same need. So I'm really park driven and community service driven this year. Um, I am very, very much looking forward to our retreat. I hope everyone makes it, it will be huge. Uh, and I hope that we can really get a lot of work and getting to know one another a little more. So thank you. All right. A uh, great new group formed in town. It's called People Against Plastic Pollution. Happy. Uh, <laughs> they're working on issues that uh, I know are dear to the uh, mayor's heart there, uh, trying to get plastic out of our community, looking at different ways we do that, coming with proactive solutions, mm -hmm. and also educating folks on what the problem is. Um, we have a plastic island twice the size of Texas flown in the Pacific Ocean right now, so... Whatever we can do locally to address that um, is so important. Um, so there's that. If anybody's interested, uh, next meeting is going to be up on North Street on the 27th. And just let me know if you want to attend that. Um, other quick just date to keep in mind, May 19th, uh, rally for public schools on the State House lawn. 
uh, from 12 to 2, uh, just supporting our great public educators. Thanks. Um, I want to echo Jack's comments about the, mm. the tours of the city departments um, and appreciation of city staff. Uh, I learned a ton of stuff, and it was a lot of fun. I would also encourage uh, more of those whenever there's an opportunity. I understand it takes a lot of staff time, but it's it's really wonderful, and I think it would be a good thing for interested residents to tag along on, too. There would be a lot of uh, value in that. Um, so thank you to the staff and, and uh, uh, everyone involved in those tours. Um, and I want to, as usual, invite anyone who's interested to come to uh, hang out with me over breakfast tomorrow morning, every Thursday. I am uh, no longer at Open Hands Cafe because Open Hands Cafe is no longer. Um, yes, uh, George Estes uh, uh, found that it wasn't working out uh, financially, so he has closed that. I will be at Baguito's tomorrow morning and for the foreseeable future. Every Thursday, 8.30 to 9.30, uh, talk about the city, anything else. Uh, Connor's uh, come and talked with, uh, with me and some residents. Uh, it's always lots of fun. Uh, I'm hoping for good weather through the summer so that I can stay outside at Baguito's. That is really fun to breakfast with. <laughs> <laughs> it, it may not be apparent. My, my morning self is very different from my evening self. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank all the organizations that had some kind of contribution to Mayfest this last weekend, and thank you to Montpelier Life for organizing and um, advertising all the events that were part of Mayfest. And um, yeah, it was great. It was great that the weather worked out. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, just a few quick things. Uh, taxes are due the 15th. It's the last quarterly payment for the tax year. Um, just to let you all know, I've had a problem been able to connect with our, our system that runs the videos, so there may not be a video of this meeting available on the website. I suspect there won't be, so I may contact Orca, see if I can get a copy of yours, or, or at least a link to yours, or something like that. Uh, we'll see. Um, just, uh, I think this is the first meeting since the uh, little meeting about the non-citizen voting. A lot of people showed up. There was a lot of interest. There was one person there who was sort of dubious about it. Um, actually said, what if two or three hundred people, you know, moved in here, immigrants moved in here so they could, non-citizens, so they could vote. I was like, where are we going to put them? <laughs> we should be so lucky, right? Uh, but in general, the crowd was very, very supportive. So I took down some names to get a working group going. We'll see where it goes. Um, the next stage would be some sort of concrete proposals. Um, so we'll just see where that ends up. Uh, I also uh, need to mention that uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, as the little signs say, we're going to have uh, several days this month where the, the, the services in the clerk's offices are limited. We will take payments, we'll always take payments, right? Um, so that's, that's not an issue, but uh, licensing, including marriage, dogs, businesses, liquor, um, are going to have to, or will not be available, and there won't be any help for record searches, for land searches, the, the information, the vault will be available, but there will be folks there to support it. And that's going to be tomorrow and the next day, um, and then the first four days of the week of the 21st, which is the week after next. And after that, there's no, I mean, I, I got nothing on my calendar until Christmas, so there shouldn't be an issue. <laughs> but that's it. Um, so thank you for all for the kind words about the, the tours. Um, I, I agree. I learned something from them all the time, and they really, uh, the staff really appreciates the interest um, from people. And speaking of tours, uh, we do need uh, our next meeting will feature the fire department. And we, originally, the thought was to hold that tour immediately preceding this meeting. But Council Member Bate, with her eagle eyes, remembered that we had set the Scribner Street. Uh, inspection at that time so I don't know if there's another time that people want to try to find for that or have us I guess 
Let's not bother it now. We'll, we'll, we'll put Jamie, uh, Jamie on it. Yeah. Uh, we'll take care of that. <laughs> Jamie does so good. Yep. And uh, speaking of which, uh, we did do the wastewater, uh, the water re resource recovery facility. We had the, the update tonight. Three of you were able to attend that. Would you like to do another one when we get closer to vote time? Or are we good? I would. If you have it, I'll certainly go. I've been there before, but it's always good. Okay. So we'll aim for that at some point whenever, whenever it's coming back on its next agenda. Um, with regard to strategic planning, uh, you should have received an email from Julia Novak, who's our consultant, and she's going to be scheduling times to talk with you, so I hope we can do that. And I just uh, want to add um, to some of the comments. This is, uh, first of all, I really appreciate that we're doing that this year and that we've got someone who's really skilled in local government leading it. But this really could be two of the most important nights that we have, not just for interaction with each other, but really laying out our agenda and the beginnings of the plans for everything for the next couple of years. So I hope people will come and be ready to work. And um, so looking, looking forward to that. I'm, I'm excited about it. That's all I have until the next, the next thing. Okay. Great. So I... Um, oh, I do have one more thing to add about last weekend. I would note that the Montpelier High School team won the Capital City Classic Ultimate Tournament. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. I wouldn't want to say anything about the coach. It was, it was very exciting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're up to the, the executive session. So, um, yes, Jack. Uh, pursuant to 1 DSA well section 313A2, I move that we go into executive session. I'll second it. Um, and we're going to invite um, Kevin, Casey. Kevin Casey in with us, and we will not be taking any action afterwards, so we won't be coming back to uh, announce anything or vote on anything. So, um, but there was a second. I second. You second. Okay. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Laura.